This episode of Discography Discussion was recorded on January 16th, 2021. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Christian Machado, and we just did three hours of talking about nothing but metal. You're listening to Discography Discography Discussion. I'm too metaled out right now. You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 207, Death Revisited, with Christian Machado. Like, you know, at work, if you, like, bust on a death album, if I was, like, your co-worker, it would totally blow my fucking mind, bro. <laughs> Hosted by Dan Terry. Thank you for showing me this band. Like, you know, this was so cool. John Beatty. Start writing riffs like Ludacris. <laughs> and Joseph Wren. And on that note... While you were talking, John, Christian Machado arrived. Dan arrived. This stream is officially underway as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) There we go. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you think nothing is actually the opposite of everything, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is John. Christian Machado is here. If you still hate me, you're thinking of me, and I'm thinking of you constantly. What's going on tonight? Man, I don't know. I'm laying low, laying low. How's that? Laying how's that? low. How's, how's that for 2021? Just laying low. Dude. It's the trend of 2020 <laughs> continued, right? Dude, I figured out, man. It's fucked up because, you know, everybody was like, 2021, come on, 2020 out of here. And then 2021 showed up, and we were like, it's the same people that were in 2020. You know, it's it's all the same shit, but hopefully it's a better year. It'll turn into a better year. Absolutely. The end is in sight. Let's all stick with it, shall we? (laughs) Right, right. Celebrate while you can. Absolutely. The meteor will hit any day now. (laughs) Oh, man, absolutely. Love this comment that just popped up, though. How many death episodes does it take? Because this is actually our second one. Um, It doesn't matter because you can never get enough death. Yeah, I mean, I can agree with that. Uh, so we're going to do the other Detroit band, Death, after this one, right? A band called Death? Yeah. <laughs> you might as well. Yeah. John, get out yeah. of my house. He's not in your house. <laughs> none, of us, none of us are allowed in your house. I think that's what we're all complaining about right now is like none of us, even if even if we all wanted to meet up together and do this, we couldn't. You know? All right. Let's so, go to Scott Bowling's house. He can house us all. go to Scott's house. There you go. Cool. So what do we want to say about Death that we haven't said before? What do you want to so know gonna, about Death? Well, I'm just going to start off with... Uh, everybody's personal i mean we already heard john's but everybody's personal experience in in hearing death for the first time and what what made you guys a fan of the band um i'll let christian go first well i have thank you for letting me go um i have like a a super fond uh memory of you know my young adulthood and late teen years um with the band death um i was a metalhead just probably like most of us were back in the day Maybe it was 90, 91, I can't exactly remember. But um, I was a metalhead just like everybody else. Death metal was unheard of, you know? You, you didn't, you never heard of, I mean, there, there, until Death and Obituary came out, there were no bands that sounded like that, you know? There, you could say, okay, Venom and Possessed, they led there and they led the way and things like that. Um, King Diamond kind of led the way as far as a little bit more groove in the metal, like. Death has a little bit of that flavor, the group. But ironically of all, the friend that turned me on to the band, because at the time I was into like Anthrax, Metallica, Maiden, you know, Santana for Latin things. I mean, a little bit of everything, but the kid that turned me on to it was a complete punk rock kid, like oi punk. Um, not like, you know, commercial punk kid, but straight up oi punk. He only liked underground punk. And, um, and later in... Like the mid 90s, I realized, man, you know, the first crowd that got into death metal were the punks. The punks like really took the the oi punks, the underground punks really took to like the the Florida kind of thrashy, even like the napalm death scum kind of thing. But as far as death, man, I mean, the, the thing that blows my mind and the thing that made me such a massive lifetime fan is they managed to do it and they managed to do it with great hooks. 
And, you know, some people would argue, ah, death metal, there's no hooks in that. It's just blah, you know, but no, there's hooks, you know, there, there, there's hooks in those songs. A song like Leprosy, Open Casket, all those songs have really, really good hooks. And in their evolution, um, similar to, to like the evolution of Thrice, I learned to like them even more as they evolved. You know, the more they put out albums, the more they evolved, the more that Chuck experimented, you could tell that he was growing in his in his musical um, experimentation, curiosity, I guess. And um, and it was Leprosy. The first album that I heard was Leprosy and then kind of went back and heard Scream Bloody Gore. But it, it was Leprosy that made me a massive death fan. I definitely agree. As a guitar player, in the early 2000s started playing when i was 15 16 i don't remember when your idol is james hetfield and you want to play thrash metal but then you also listen to the clash and that old school punk rock then you listen to death i could see the appeal bleeding into those fans but one thing you said and we've had this argument before not you and me christian but dan and me ongoing till the end of time is death actually death metal yes I mean, so i imagine thrash fans would argue that they were first a thrash metal band you know like scream bloody gore is an extremely thrashy album when i was listening to it for a little while last week you know just kind of like reminiscing the discography um man i realized how much that album influenced sepultura because scream bloody gore Damn, it sounds like early Sepultura. I mean, death definitely influenced Sepultura. And, you know, Beneath the Remains was an album that was just death, but a little bit more commercial and a little bit more group. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. And I remember Sepultura being presented to me as a death metal band, like early on. Um, and I would listen to the records and... Uh, I would listen to the records and think, oh man, this sounds not all that different than what Slayer's doing. It's a little bit a little bit more intense in my opinion, a little bit more real, I guess. But um but yeah, I would agree there. And I think I think with a, with an album like Scream Bloody Gore, um, you know, yeah, it's gonna be mostly thrash. I think the bones in there are thrash. But what I think what I think what it, what the really big difference is is number one, the lyrical content. Which, you know, it's not like there aren't thrash bands that were talking about the same ridiculous things. But, um, you know, like almost like horror movie, you know, type of type of themes. Um, but there was something about the drumming on Scream Bloody Gore that that hits me a lot harder in the death metal uh, in the death metal territory. The drumming, uh, Chuck's vocals, Chuck's vocals were just a little bit more than what uh, what a lot of the thrash bands were doing. The only other band I can think of that, that kind of reminded me of that early on was like something like a creator or something like that. Like, so, I mean, there's thrash bones in it, but I think, I think as far as being an established thing, like death metal going forward, you can't, you can't get to modern day death metal without scream bloody gore. No, no, I agree. I agree. The thrash fans would argue, you know, like, ah, it's more thrash than it is, but really it was like the next step from, you know, a band like Venom, which you could definitely say they're thrash metal. They're not really a death metal band, you know? Right. There's that gray area that happened in the 80s, though, where everybody was kind of together in the fight, at least in the United States. It was everyone that was a pop band or had a hair metal band that played pop music and wanted all the girls. And then there was the metal guys, to quote whatever Metallica documentary that was. Might have been VH1 behind the music where they talked about wearing venom shirts and just all going to the shows and tearing people apart so whether it was death metal thrash metal yeah everybody was kind of together in that way but when i listen to death i don't hear the same type of metal when i think thrash metal i think mo those other bands like the metallica mega death but then when i think about death metal i don't think of death either i think of death being its own unique thing that evolves over the discography and that's one of the reasons why we're so upset that we don't get any more death no i i, I agree i was just agreeing because if you listen to an album like human it is ultimately this huge evolution from where they came from you know 
but it still has this extremely dark essence that was Chuck. I guess that's just who Chuck was. He heard music in his head a way he only could, you know? But I agree that there was something more to what they did, you know? I think that's why, I think that's why they were able to have the career they did, man. They were definitely like, you know, one of the most prolific love bands in the death metal scene. I know for me, I started with The Sound of Perseverance, and that's Dan's fault because Dan made a huge mistake. He played me the cover of Painkiller before playing Man. anything else. So, Dude, how good is that, though? It's terrifyingly good because compared to the Judas Priest original, it's kind of sloppy in places. Uh -huh. But then it just picks itself up and ties itself together, and you start to convince yourself that the way Chuck Schuldner decides to sing it is the way it's supposed to sound. It creates a conflict in my mind, like, no, that's that's not supposed to be right, but I want it to be for the next five minutes. Well, I'm going to save my thoughts on that for when we get to uh, Sound of Perseverance, but um, as far as the first time that I heard death was, I had a um, I had a a, a, uh, a friend named Kurt, I remember. We hung out all the time, and ironically, he was in a punk band. Uh, he was in a punk band called The Deficit. Uh, and I was in a I was in a hardcore band or a, actually we weren't really a hardcore band. We were like more like a Linkin Park, you know, uh, but I screamed a lot. So I was like, it's hardcore, right? Like the, it's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I hung out with that dude all the time and he and he took it upon himself to show me good music. He was like, no, all this stuff that you're listening to is crap. You know, it just it's it's all garbage. I don't like it. It's It's not my favorite. And uh, I was like, okay, well, what would you suggest? And so he burned me like three death CDs. He burned me human, sound of perseverance, uh, and individual thought patterns. And for the most part, individual thought patterns was the one that I that I really, really jumped onto uh, because I like kind of the deeper vocals uh, from Chuck. I like how melodic that record is, how technical. I wouldn't have even known what technical was, uh, really. You know, like I, I knew that I liked what it sounded like, but. At that time, there was no way I could be like, oh, well, this is cool because it's in a cool time signature or uh, this is cool for this reason or that reason. And so in that in that sense, I was just like, well, uh, this just is going to be what it is. Uh, and I really like it and I can't even describe why. And then I guess that would have been that would have been like 2002 or something like right whenever I was uh, still in, I guess, still in high school. And so, yeah, that was uh that was absolutely one of the weirdest experiences of my life. And I haven't caught up with Kurt. I, now that I've met, I haven't mentioned his name in a long time. So uh, I probably should try to track that dude down and be like, dude, like, <laughs> thank you for showing me this band. Like, you know, this was so cool. Shout out to uh, Kurt. I miss that guy. Yeah. Now I've done, now I've done two episodes now uh, about the, about this band that you showed me like way back in the day. Uh, and I've been hooked ever since. And it was kind of a shock going back to the older stuff, you know, but I think for the most part, it was all good, like overall. Um, like, I don't I don't really I remember, like, kind of wishing that the older albums were more melodic, like pretty much anything before Spiritual Healing, which would have been like Leprosy and Scream Bloody Gore. Uh, I liked those records a lot. And as I've gotten older, I really appreciate them. But um, it, it's kind of weird starting at the later point in the band's career and then kind of going backwards. Yeah, I could see how it, it de definitely, especially if you start at the sound of perseverance, because it's like the more organic sounding death out. You know, it's got like this more band kind of sound, which I imagine Chuck was just like, man, we put out so many like super tight sounding albums. Like they were incredibly tight. And I imagine he said to himself, I just want to do something different. I wanted to sound different. And I thought that that was cool for them to do that. Um, you know, it, it definitely is, a, is an album that has a different sound. But I could see how how it could appeal to someone because of that organic kind of thing that it has. Well, Dan, do you want to do the thing that we do for this show and then start this thing at the beginning the way we're supposed to? <laughs> yeah, let's start it out uh, at the beginning. Yeah, why not? Well, before Dan uses a time machine to look forward in time, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Twitch.tv forward slash DiscussMetalDan for all your live streaming and gaming needs. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast. 
and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about Five Star Reviews. Well, we do enjoy some five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. Uh, They always make me feel better, but uh, honestly, you're the listener, and you ultimately decide how you feel. So uh, leave us whatever kind of review you think we deserve on whatever kind of podcasting app that you use. And uh, we really, really appreciate that. And, you know, um, if there's ever anything that you want to talk about, always feel free to reach out to us. There's there's a lot of ways that you can do that, and we'll I'll tell you all about them uh, at the end of the show. Christian, it's 2021. What do you have coming up this year? Um, oh man, I don't know. I was hoping to play some shows this year, but talked to my booking agent the other day. He was like, no, that's not happening. (laughs) And I was like, all right, I guess. Um, but this year, man, music, working, probably just music and work and doing sessions, passing the time best I can. Um, what's up with that project? That too, you know, just doing that. (laughs) <laughs> that thing that, that thing yeah <laughs> got that, got that, that thing that yep. thing yep. that thing that we all know about but we can't talk about yep <laughs> well, actually no i think i mean christian i think at this point has already been known that he's been working on a, another project with the other members of formerly of el nino yeah yeah, yeah we I have know. a full record done but we don't have a name yet that's the mm-hmm. funniest thing ever <laughs> we'll give you one <laughs> yeah man if you got names text me bro hook it up ex nino <laughs> Ex Nino. Way that to hit that one on the head, John Beatty. That's a good way to go right back to court. But yeah. <laughs> uh, you can't say that on the live stream. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not behaving myself here. But uh but yeah, man, like uh death. Let's are, are we ready to go back into death? Because I that's what I'm here for, my friend. Let's just get right back into I can death. read all my YouTube comments and all that so I'll just sum that up in about three minutes uh, I did a video recently uh, about a band on YouTube uh, that I just felt like was charging people a little too much for a live show um, that ended up going way more viral than I was expecting it to uh, and so I'm not going to read all of the comments that that generated uh, <laughs> all, like, like right now uh, all I have to say is that uh if you watch that video and you thought it was weird and different, it was. That's not typically the type of stuff that I want to release, uh, but it was just something that, that was bothering me and I just felt like talking about it. So, uh, but yeah, if you guys have any more comments about that particular subject, you can uh, you can always hit me up. Uh, just send an email, Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com, and uh, we will talk about it. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Dan, and I'm here from the future, your favorite podcast host of all time. What, nobody? Okay, well, you know what? I appreciate you guys, okay? So there's a few people that I want to name by name right here on the podcast. These are our wonderful Patreon supporters, and they are the following. Christopher and Rebecca Sherling, Jack, Tyler, Josiah Heiberg, Luke Robinson, Brandon Miranda, Ken Zapla, Tantalized Fungians. Best name ever. Jeremy Prince, Josh Moser, David Brown, Samuel Woodward, Brian Dean, Kiki Kuti, do you love me? I do love you. Lance Allegood, the king of metal. Alexander, Patrick Asplund, and Jeffrey De Los Santos. The actual Mac. You guys are the music makers. I really appreciate everything that you guys do and your interactions on all of the cool Patreon exclusive stuff that you guys get to interact with. So keep it up. We'll see you every single month with those individual album reviews. And uh, you guys now have a really cool option for early access. When we record an episode or we live stream it or we put it on YouTube or whatever we decide to do, you guys are going to get that first. We'll send you a link directly to a hidden YouTube video that nobody gets to see until after the episode comes out. So be sure to check that out. And again, I appreciate you guys from the entirety of my heart. And now back to your regularly scheduled podcast. So, Christian, tell me about death. Um, death, man. I mean, dude, they were they were a huge inspiration on me. I mean, when I first came into the metal scene, I was a bass player, vocalist, somewhat, um, and I just. Man, I just took to them right away. I don't know what it was. Possibly the notes and the way the way they perceive their melodic element, or 
Um, the heaviness, obviously, at the time was something that I really, really loved. I was a metalhead, and um, I'm always going to be a metalhead and have a little special spot in my heart for bands that sound like that. But death was like above and beyond the, you know, the what I felt was the leaders. I don't, I don't know where death metal would have wound up if Chuck would have never been born and put those albums out. Um, and the one thing I regret is I haven't been able to see them. Um, I wish I would have been able to see them. By the time I got into them, they weren't touring as much. And I guess maybe, maybe Chuck was having health issues already. I don't know, but I know that it, there was one time where they came around New York City and I decided I wasn't going to go to the show, that I was just going to hang out and do something else. And I regretted it heavily after that, not having gone to the show. It was the last time they played New York City. But to me, Death is a band that really couldn't be replicated, you know? And and special music is like that, I guess. It's, it's the brain of a human being that's a musician and how they perceive everything in the world, including music, and how they, you know, um, put that into their instrument or how they decide they want to put music together. But Chuck had an insane, an insane way of doing his own thing, not really bowing down to anything that was happening in the industry. You could tell in the music that they were fans of metal, but that they sought to make it something else. That That's why I, I kind of agree when, when you say, is death really death metal? Their evolution led them somewhere that was really, really unique. And um, and I think that they're 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 going to be known as the what, the greatest death metal band, not because they're called death, you know, but just because of the music they put out. <laughs> yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, they're really in a class on uh, of their own, and I think that really to compare them to other bands really does them and the other bands a disservice because like it's not fair to compare another band to death because death was so good. Uh, it's also not fair to compare death to other bands because they're just never going to match up. You know, it's, uh, it's, and, and of course, a lot of this is nostalgia talking. I mean, I could, I could go through a record, like I could go through a record, like scream bloody gore. Sure. And do the music critic thing and put my hat on and be like, well, this was sloppy here. And this was, uh, th you know, this was off time or, you know, uh, vocals don't have any variety or, <laughs> you know, any, any of that stuff. Uh, but I think it's one of those things where you kind of have to step back and look at it, uh, look at it, you know, look at the whole picture and, and, and realize kind of what they were trying to do there. And um, with a record like Scream Bloody Gore, you know, they really they really broke through, not necessarily in the mainstream, but as far as just going there, I felt like up until Scream Bloody Gore came out, there were a lot of bands that kind of hinted around like dark subject matter and uh, and, and extremity, extremity in, in vocals and extremity in drumming and in and, and guitar. And I feel like death crossed over the line a couple of steps that maybe some of the thrash bands at the time didn't cross. And I think that's really what distinguished them, especially on Scream Bloody Gore, uh, to reach the level that they did. Um, and I, really, that record is, is outrageously impressive to me, if only because it was essentially recorded by like Chuck and another guy. Like, it wasn't even a full band. Like, Chuck did almost everything on that record. 1987. Wow, dude, that's insane. I mean, just thinking that Scream Bloody Gore came out in 87, it's so ahead of its time. Music became so aggressive after that, you know? Because really, I mean, let's, let's discuss what was happening in 1987. To put it into context, it was, it was like, you know, right off of... Um, Master of Puppets and going into the Garage Days revisited and it was almost Injustice for All Time around then, you know? There were other bands doing it a little bit more extreme, but but you're I, I have to agree, man. I mean, on Scream Bloody Gore, they made they made a stance with that album. They weren't like everybody else. And to I I imagine Chuck might have been like, oh, we're just playing thrash or something, or we're just doing this because we like it. But what it came out being is something that when you look back and you have, you know, you observe in context, but it, at the time, it's leaps ahead of anything aggressive or extreme that anybody else was doing. Yeah. And like the lyrics, you know, uh, I want to give a special mention to the lyrics because I remember just being downright shocked whenever I whenever I read the lyrics to uh, Scream Bloody Gore, uh, just because like not shocked in the sense of like, 
oh my god i'm so offended like you know clutching my pearls i can't believe they said that you know um if you're if you listen to metal you kind of kind of already know what you're getting yourself into you know as far as some of that stuff goes uh but this was this was a time period where people's lyrics weren't overly emotional you know especially in metal it was just like how do i how do i be super angry and super aggressive and pissed off at the world and because you don't really want to show your feelings or emotions uh you instead end up going in kind of into this kind of more horror like horror fantasy world uh sort of sort of place uh, and that's how you get a song like zombie ritual you know uh, <laughs> You know, talking about zombie whores and drink from the goblet, the goblet of gore. And it's like, it would be funny for me if I was delivering those vocals, you know, to like not to not just bust up laughing like while, while I'm singing it, because it's so it's so dumb. But at the same time, when you're a kid and you're listening to this, you're like, this is so awesome. My mom's going to be so pissed if she ever hears me listening to this record. You know, she's not even going to understand what Chuck's saying, you know, but like. It's just it's just the concept of it, the, the, this idea of just being as disgusting as as humanly possible. Um, and we always joke on this show that at the end of every single crazy line like that, you know, um, you, you just insert the word. Yeah, mom, <laughs> you know, at the end of that, just just seeing just seeing who you can piss off the most. And that's that's all Scream Bloody Gore is for me. Lyrically, it's just a kind of like, yeah, what do you think about that song, mom? Let's see what the first lyric on that whole album is. I'm going to look it up right now. Let's see. The first lyric on the whole album on Zombie Ritual is revengeful corpse out to kill. That is so, so big, brutal. You know, <laughs> the zombies will get your ass, you know. They're coming. Is that like a is that like a cannibal corpse? Wait a <laughs> second. Revengeful when corpse. did Revenge of the Living Dead come out? <laughs> right? Or Return of the Living Dead, excuse me? Yeah. He's got a great rhyme after that though. He's got revengeful corpse out to kill. Smell the stench, your guts will spill. Burn those bodies <laughs> to infernal I mean, death. Was there anything that gory before then? I mean, how gory did like Venom and Possessed get before that? I'm trying to remember because so, and I want to think what was it? Creator uh, had that record, Pleasure to Kill, um, but I don't remember what year that was. If that was after '87 or not. I mean, I guess I could look. I'm on a computer, but like it's it's one of those like I feel like Creator was getting kind of close to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's hard. Uh, but I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody solely like like those bands that we're talking about er- earlier. You know, like you're possessed and Venom and stuff. Like every now and again, they would have a song like that. But with Death, I mean, that was the entire album. <laughs> that was the that was. The creator lyrics are pleasure to kill. Day turns to night as I rise from my grave. Black was the hole where I lay, stalking the city to seek out your blood. It's a little bit more poetic is what it is, you know? It is. It's more artistic. Guess, yeah. Yeah, Millie was kind of like trying to like storytell it where Chuck was just full out. He had bars. Yeah. Chuck was just full out gore. And he, I, I guess he was into the, the lifestyle, you know, the mindset of being death metal, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, they, that's whenever they. I think it was back when they when Death was called Mantis, which was for their first name. Uh, they released a demo called Death by Metal, you know, yeah, and so that kind of that kind of uh, that's a I really feel good like name of, too. Yeah, kind of spearheaded. It's so, it's so thrash metal to call your record like you know Death by Metal, you know, like that. That's a, it's just like Metallica's like Metal up your ass or you know like like that sort of like oh look at how cool this is. This is so like yeah man Death by Metal. And I've listened to that demo and I can't even distinguish a single song out of it because it's just noise, but um but it's still cool like from a historical I guess uh, sort of sort of perspective. It's a lot of the songs that actually ended up already being on Scream Bloody Gore, so you still kind of get all that stuff back. One of the things that stands out to me every time I listen to this record, Chuck Shoulder is doing those vocals while being the lead guitarist. I have never been able to process that. Because if I heard this for the first time, I would not think that this vocalist is doing those guitar parts. Yeah, you have the James Hetfields and the... Dave Mustaines, who can play rhythm guitar most of the time and still do vocals. So maybe Chuck could do that. But then when you figure out he's playing the leads, that's insane. Yeah. That takes a, that's a level of mental coordination that I don't know has ever been duplicated in metal. 
to this degree. Yeah, I maybe. Agree. Yeah, maybe duplicated, but not until much later. You know, um, the old adage is true that you know, no matter how heavy or extreme you are, there's always going to be somebody heavier, somebody more extreme, somebody more technical. You know, whatever. Uh, but I think what's interesting about death is that you know, on Scream Bloody Gore especially, um, they kind of became. Like that record, I think we can all agree that record was childish in a way, but massively influential. Childish in the sense of like, I'm on the big stage. I'm about to put my first record out on Combat Records, which is like one of the best record labels, you know, that you could be on, you know, in 1987 uh, for this type of more extreme music. And, um, you know, this is this is their debut to the world. And Chuck just basically just belches out everything, you know, and just like just every every single crazy messed up idea that he had, he put on Scream Bloody Gore. Um, And I think that's really, really cool. But what I think is even more cool is the strides that they made that he made in assembling a new band and then moving on into Leprosy and the type of musical growth that they showed kind of moving on from that initial spark of death metal. 1988. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it that way, that record was way ahead of its time. Scream Bloody Gore was way ahead of its time. And just listening to some of the songs now, definitely the drumming, because the riffs, you know, you could you could hear how maybe it evolved out of the metal before that a little bit, even though it was interpreted so incredibly different by Chuck. But the drumming, I, I'm going to have to agree. That's what kind of started driving metal into the more uh, groovy um, like the, 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 the duplet kick drum snare, like the one, two to the bat, to the bat, to the bat, to the bat that you would that would be defined more as like what Sepultura did during the beginning of their career, you know, it was almost like a, a slow down thrash because thrash was always like, go fast go fast, you know, the faster you go the better you are, and I think on Scream Bloody Gore Maybe they were fans of thrash, but they definitely slowed it down. They brought it to a different area where perhaps, you know, I know Chuck was a huge King Diamond fan, so that might have influenced him to kind of take things down a, a notch and put them in a different, um, you know, put, put the heavy music, the extremity in a different realm. I definitely see that because, yes, it's intense. Yes, it's heavy. Yes, they're playing fast, but they've already released that first record. This is when you pace yourself. Maybe because you've released the record where everything was as fast as possible and now you want to try and slow it down because can anyone really go 300 beats per minute all the time? Chuck probably could. Gene probably could. We'll get to him momentarily. But then when you slow down, you bring more groove into what would be par for the course thrash metal if it wasn't being played by Chuck Schuldner and this band. But there's something here that makes it stand differently. It's it's presented differently, even if it's just cosmetically. There are other records that came out in 1988 that don't sound this good. And then you have the playing the riffs, the solos, everything else on top of that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Leprosy is awesome, and I, I really want to get I really want to get John's input on Leprosy with this being the first time he'd ever listened to Death. I think that's that's kind of the more unique thing in this conversation is you got three guys here that have been listening to Death forever, and then you've got John who's like, I'm here to see what the big deal is, you know, like what 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 what's all the, what's all the hype about, and. Uh, so John, what were what were your thoughts on uh, on leprosy? Um, so obviously, with you know, kind of just to touch real fast on Scream Bloody Gore for me to kind of set up how I felt about leprosy. Um, I think the thing, and you know, you guys kind of touched on it for this coming for Scream Bloody Gore that is coming out in 1987. I feel like this sounds better than a lot of their contemporary records or even records that came out a few years later, um, which is pretty impressive considering the recording technology back then. Um, the thing I wasn't a big fan of on Scream Bloody Gore was kind of Chuck's monotonous vocal approach. Uh, it, But I have to say it's probably because money didn't exist really back then for shit like this. Uh, so it's probably an instance of, up, you got one take to do your vocals, maybe a second pass if. 
And that's probably why the songs kind of sound the way they do to me. Um, but, you know, I definitely think the uh, music mu- and musicianship on Scream Bloody Gore uh, really stands out. And it makes me wonder because his kind of singular driving point of the band. So it's literally his vision. And other than the drumming, he's what moves it forward. So it doesn't it doesn't get muddled down by other people trying to showcase themselves too much. Now, with that being said, with Leprosy, for me, I feel like the enunciation and production on Chuck's vocals are leaps and bounds better than they were on the last one, which really is one of my gripes about this style of music is that you can't understand it and the production is tinny as shit. Um, I do kind of find it amusing uh, in listening to this that you can always tell what the song title is on any death song and it, it continues moving forward too because you always can hear this dude yelling the song title uh, kind of right in the middle of the song. It's always like, if you aren't sure what it is, whatever he's screaming kind of about the middle point of the song, that's probably what the song title is. Excuse me. Um, Also, pull the plug. When he screams, pull the plug! Dude, that shit is hard. (laughs) With that fucking fucking breakdown beat uh, after it, too. Um, Overall, for me, this is a lot more of an enjoyable listening experience, you know, Joking aside about the Scream song titles and so forth, uh, you know, songs like Open Casket, Primitive Ways, uh, those are very replayability uh, factors on, you know, this record for me. And that's not something I find on music like this for me personally. Um, Love the more dynamic songwriting uh, and approach uh, gives, you know, something I've kind of echoed on the few shows I've been on consistently since being a co-host. I love when metal gives itself a chance to breathe. It really makes more of an impact when something comes in and just fucking pummels you because you had a moment to be like, oh, fuck, all right. Oh, no, getting pulled back in. And to me, (laughs) that's kind of where I feel. And I know I already said this joke before, so I won't say it again. No, fuck it. I'll say it again. Um, This is kind of where the progressive metal kind of tinge starts shining through and the Danny DeVito parts, as I like to call them again. So I started blasting. Um, You've Those already made are, that always sunny reference this week, I know, John. I know. I don't give a fuck. It's a great reference. That's gonna be that's gonna be my catchphrase. You too all can hot. have yours. Too hot. You all have yours. Yeah. I want to be did, pure. I want to be pure, Joe. You need to tell you need to tell him what you told me earlier this week on leprosy, how it was the very first time you ever this is probably the first time they ever did a bleh on, oh, yeah. on, it on might, a record. It yeah. might be. And I asked Dan, I go, is that the first bleh? On record, in the first black, you're right. Damn, bro. And it had that reverb on, like, on it too, so it like, eh, 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 on it too. So it was like extra stank was on that motherfucker. Wow, <laughs> architects, architects is going to be real upset. That oh, dude, the whole death core genre is going to be for them. Really dumb. <laughs> I mean, but you yeah. can't expect to sell records to kids if you don't do the black. I mean, you you have to do it. Well, they didn't uh, know that. As sketchy, that. As, sketchy as, as the new shit that we're doing with Ruin Diego is, that one song I have a black. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, so you got to be like, you're going to bring the black, group, Christian? I do, and I remember doing it, and the producer was like, you're really going to put black in there. <laughs> did you just like, give him the oh, look like, hey, it. Chuck oh, Schuldner did it. I can do it. I that's was when like, you that's the only thing that sounds right. <laughs> that's when you pull your that's when you push the glasses up and go, um <clears throat> actually, uh this uh this bleh has existed ever since uh, death's leprosy. Uh you know, if you were if you really knew anything about metal, you would know that. Uh <laughs> but uh yeah, like dude, leprosy is is my favorite of the two. Uh of Scream Bloody Gore, you know, the first two albums. Uh, everything starts getting really interesting on spiritual healing, but um, what 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 I like about leprosy number one is the catchiness, the hooks. Um, Pull the plug is such a good song that it deserves its own like separate release. Like I I would buy a record that had only pull the plug on it on vinyl. You know, just pull the plug on one side. Oh, that was really cool. Flip it over and it's just pull the plug again on the next side. You know, like I would I would I would buy that record like right now. And um, that song is so disgustingly good that, they, I mean, they, they played it throughout their career. Even whenever they moved away from this style, kind of, they, they still, every single live show, you had to end it with Pull the Plug. I mean, it just, it was just, it was just that good. It, it, it established what a metal song, like what an extreme metal song was supposed to sound like. And it just, it, it just, it still rings with me all the time. Like, there's not a time in my life when somebody's all like, yeah, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about checking out harder music, and I'm really into Metallica, or Megadeth, 
do you have any songs of bands that I should listen to that would like get me into like heavier stuff and every single time I'm yeah pull the plug go listen to pull the plug you'll you'll love it that's hooks man it's just a song that's got really really good hooks but like John said open casket too is is like a song that's got really really good replayability as you called it you know because it's got a lot of really good parts and things you would want to hear again that 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 was you know that, that that's what was odd about death is that at the time extreme music was very you know on the same plane you know it, it didn't have these dynamics and things like that that i think um that i i think chuck was trying to experiment with i mean who knows where he was inspired by you know but apparently he wound up at something that was really really unique that i think allowed even you know the evolution into bands like pantera to occur because they they managed to make it heavy but still have parts that stop and then a groove comes in and then it comes back at a different little tempo and you know you, you could you could see how without leprosy um i don't know how the evolution of metal might have gone a little bit different totally agree yeah i think i think leprosy was also like them really capitalizing on the hooks um like john john was kind of making fun of earlier it's like yeah there you can never you never have to worry about what song you're on because he's gonna he's gonna re- re- repeat the name of that song uh, like <laughs> 400 times uh, in that song. But I mean that that's also kind of a big deal for Chuck at this point because Scream Bloody Gore, uh, you know, yeah, obviously I know every single song. Like I don't get them mixed up or anything. But like I didn't feel that way the first time I listened to it. You look at John, who probably only got to listen to it once or twice. You know, uh, before before we did this. And I can totally see how, you know, you might get a little bit like, oh, this is starting to sound like a wall of noise. Uh, it's a good wall of noise. Uh, like, I'll take that any day over something I don't like. But uh, Phil Spector levels of good. Yeah, totally. But uh, with Leprosy, it, it definitely got a lot more hooky. It got a lot more commercial. Uh, but I have to throw that caveat, like commercial for death metal. Yeah. Uh, it, it, groovy, maybe. Like, they put a lot more groove in it. Perhaps would be a good way to describe it. This is one of those times where it's unfortunate that I can't ask this question because when I listen to this and I listen to the bands that this influenced, or at least stylistically it appears to influence, I really do wonder, where was Chuck Schuldner's brain? Because of the constant evolution of the sound. From 1988 to 1998... Yes, it's still death. Yes, it's still Chuck, but his vocals change. The production changes a little bit. Band members change. The songs change. They become more intense. They slow down. They speed up. Everything that he does, this formula is very unique to him. I can find bits and pieces that other people have done, but I really do wonder what was he influenced by? What was he thinking? Because I can't point to one thing and say, oh, that's where Chuck got that, vocally or melodically. I can't, I can't pull that out of the music and point to a source like I can with some other bands. It's like a chicken and the egg. You know, like... The answer is Chuck Schuldner. Well, no, I hear... Yeah, the answer is Chuck <laughs> Schuldner. If you really that question. But, like, but really, like, it's chicken and the egg in that, like, obviously we've heard so many bands that are, were influenced by this record, influenced by death in general. Uh, and you know, so you hear that and then you go back and you listen to death and you're like, okay, how did he know that this was going to be so popular the, how this was going to catch on, uh, in music. And the, the reality is, is he didn't know the, the only reason we hear it, uh, from these newer bands is because of what he did on leprosy. So it's like, what's the answer? Like, is it, he's a time traveler? Like, did he just know that like people are going to be into that? But then like, that's not really a good explanation either because, he had no frame of reference for what was going to be popular. Uh, And I don't think he necessarily was, I don't think Chuck was doing any of this to be innovative as much as it was. He was just trying to make music that, that, that pushed him creatively. Like he's just like, how, how do I, how can I do this metal thing? But, but differentiate myself from what everybody else is doing. Uh, And I think uh, obviously, you know, he accomplished that. Uh, and as we go on, which I think we probably should move on, so we're not so we're not here all night. But uh, the uh, <laughs> but like whenever you get into spiritual healing, it even goes like even further because like I can understand hearing a record like Leprosy and being like, oh wow, man, like that was really incredible. I'm I'm <laughs> I can't believe that was as good as it was. They probably didn't put anything else out after that that was any good. 
and you'd be dead wrong. <laughs> 1990. Definitely the thing that, that should, the last thing we should say about leprosy is it for sure drew the line of where thrash was and where death metal should go. For sure that album kind of carved, you know, how dark death metal should be, parts that speed up and slow down. It wasn't like this thrashy thing where you might have like two tempos per song, but death metal, death, the leprosy album definitely uh, set the bar, I suppose, for where the growth of extreme music, maybe at the time they didn't call it death metal, but let's just say extreme music just for argument's sake. Yeah, I think they called it like next level, if I remember from from the old promotional material. Um, and again, I wasn't really around back then, but I've, I collect one of the things that I like collecting old music magazines and reading like what they this, what they said, you know, about some of these bands uh, whenever they were first coming out. And they would call bands like death, like next level metal. Uh, that was their big thing. Um, next level. So it was like bands like death and bands like uh, believer and like these, these like technical bands that like, when you listen to them, you would think that they were like technical thrash bands, uh, but they would call it next level because they didn't really know what else to call it, you know, because it wasn't, it wasn't exactly thrash, um, but it would appeal to thrash fans, you know, so they just called it next level, which I thought was a really interesting kind of marketing term. And whenever you get into whenever you get into spiritual healing, like, oh, my God, like you're going to put James Murphy and Chuck Schuldner on the same record. Like, yes, <laughs> good luck, <laughs> you know, uh, and of course, you know, I like James Murphy from what he did with, in obituary. Um, but I mean, he was in death before that, I believe. I think it was like like six months before uh, he was in obituary, he was in death doing spiritual healing and spiritual healing is where it really starts getting interesting musically and lyrically. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It was, it was almost like, like Chuck said, okay, I did a record and a half of that. Where am I going? Where else am I going? Like he couldn't, he wasn't a person to ever, uh, um, you know, just stay stagnant with his evolution of music, which I, I admire artists like that. They're, they're, my favorite artists are the ones that can evolve, but not completely throw away the essence of who they are. And I, and I think definitely spiritual he does in that, that it, it went the next step from leprosy. You know, it also sounded a little bit cleaner. You could say, uh, maybe not as scoop. It didn't have the mid range as scooped as much. And, um, and it also brought a different lyrical um, influence that I, I don't know really where Chuck might have been coming from at that time. I imagine maybe he said to himself, OK, I've written a lot of songs about these very dark, extreme topics. Um, let me experiment with this religious theme a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's the evolution of a, of a mastermind musician is really what I see in spiritual healing. He was going somewhere, even though at the time you really didn't know where he's going, you know, because you can't envision the future the way he was envisioning the, the, that genre in his own way. And who knows if even he had the vision of, you know, 10 years from now, this is what death metal should sound like. He was probably also just experimenting and doing things he liked. Like you said, he wasn't trying to please something or do something like another way. He really just wanted to make himself happy playing music that he thought was cool. It's weird. I didn't. I didn't write this note down for this record, but I had it for the the next one we're going to talk about. Is this possibly this genre's shape of punk to come? It could be. You know, I mean, not for nothing, but that. Yeah, it, that's a really good observation. Yeah, you're onto something with that um, because this is such a huge dynamic shift. I mean, first of all, death has evolved so much melodically at this point you know what i mean they, they've become a amazing um they've become an amazing band at crafting songs like there's no doubt like 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 amazing heavy songs like death metal songs uh at a time when people just expected death metal to just be like a, a dirge you know what i mean like just not anything that had any substance to it and here's chuck over here being like okay so we've we figured out how to make death metal catchy but then on the flip side of that, we've we've figured out um, how to also make it sound really good, like to the point where like people that are not even into death metal are going to hear those melodies and they're going to hear all that stuff. And it's going to create an impression on them that they that they didn't think that they were extreme metal fans, but it turns out uh, that they actually were. 
and I think lyrically too, there's so much to pull from this record uh, in that like Chuck's not talking about zombie, like raping zombie whores. <laughs> you know what I mean? At this point, Chuck's not talking about, um, he's not talking about, you know, a, a decapitated head, you know, licking your private parts, you know, like, like it, we're not there anymore. You know, now he's actually talking about stuff that's more, uh, you know, no pun intended, but more philosophical, you know, um, he's, he's, he's going more for like, this is what Chuck thinks about this particular subject. Um, you know, and so like, um, yeah, I mean, like these records are, or this record in particular is really special to me because he's still trying to reach those like extremes. You know, he's not trying to like dumb it down to make it more melodic. He's trying to be melodic and heavy at the same time. Uh, and I think that that's super admirable. And I think that him having lyrics that actually mean something, because I think at the time, death metal was a stereotype. You know, there, there are three records in, right? And having like like three records in, now you've got something to prove beyond just being, you know, a heavy band. Now you you have to be able to reach out to people that wouldn't normally listen to a band like you. And to have lyrics like that, you know, that were a little bit more real, a little bit more like, He's him starting to actually incorporate his own worldview into things, uh, I think was super, super cool. And then you start realizing too that like metal is not just like tough guys in leather jackets, uh, playing heavy riffs and then headbanging the whole time. It's like, no, dude, this guy is super intelligent, you know, and and actually thinks about things like, like, really, like, like for a long time and forms like a really good, uh, a really good, like idea on what he actually thinks about something and then he he expresses that in his art which is like the ultimate like gentlemanly thing to do you know um and so for that spiritual healing wins a lot of points in my books because uh it's a record that i can actually take some take a little bit away from you know like 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 the entire point of like spiritual healing with him going for that like religious aspect of just being like dude a lot of people uh, a lot of people go to church on sundays or a lot of people watch church on TV and they send money to people. And then these people are, these people are actually like bad people, you know, <laughs> like, like, like that sort of thing. And, um, and I think the cover, the cover really explains that. I don't know. Just the whole package is just, is just so well done for me that like, and, and normally I, this is where I'd be like, yeah, this is my favorite album by the band, but like, Oh my God, it gets better. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's a really good observation that you made because without a doubt, 100% Chuck was an incredibly intelligent human being. You know, um, you know, if you listen to his earlier stuff like the demo and, and Scream Bloody Gore, some people would be inclined to think, oh, I, you know, that guy's playing music that you can't really understand that much. How intelligent can he be? But he was really, really smart, dude. And you're absolutely right on spiritual healing. It's almost like he said to himself, you know, people might just think we're just playing dumb music if we don't evolve and do something and really say something. And it could have been out of him wanting to do it, or it could have been he just got tired and wanted to say something differently. And he just found, well, you know what? I'll, I'll speak about the way how I feel about things and mentally where I'm at, because that's really what spirit was. What spiritual healing in is? Um, it's an album that kind of psychologically walks you through what Chuck's mentality might have been at the time through stories. Though he's not blatantly telling you this is what I think. This is how I feel. This is how I view the world. But he does begin to put his own personality into the stories. And it, it, it definitely is the album that begins to walk you to that full, conscious, open lyricism that is in human. Where human, you know, you start to get songs like Lack of Comprehension that really begin to question, you know, where we are as humans, how we feel, why do we think certain ways. I think spiritual healing was that first step where he said, you know, let, let me speak for myself or how do I feel? You know, let me put this, let me put my actual emotions on this album um, without going too much into the theme of what death is, but just almost like sculpted. He almost like sculpted a new theme for himself, really lyrically. And this is the first time when he's putting exclamation points on the music and the vocals at the same times in the same songs. Every time I listen to Spiritual Healing, and this might be the record I've spent the least time with, it sounds to me like Chuck wrote one piece of music, 
just him, his vocals, and a guitar. And that was laid out so perfectly that you just added other musicians to it. It doesn't sound like he sat down and wrote a thrash metal song or a death metal song. It sounds like this is the record. I finished it. And the reason he did it that way is because he had something to say. Like you said, it's spiritual healing. This is what I need the song to be. So when he plays fast and when he plays slow and he does these dissonant walking riffs that just move down the guitar, move the way back up, whether it's single notes or chords and playing fast to defensive personalities where it sounds like the old school death from Leprosy and Scream Bloody Gore. So I love listening to this record because even though it sounds like one person had one message and that was what it needed to be, it sounds complete. It doesn't sound fake. It sounds like exactly what Chuck needed it to be. And his vocals, as they do throughout the discography, have changed a little bit more. They've become more brisk. They've become more shatter sounding, if that makes any sense. And also more tones and spiritual healing. He's got like a little bit more different pitches in there, you know, where Absolutely. I he, at the time, maybe he felt there are different tone, vocal tones in death metal. Let me experiment a little bit more with it. It could have been that. Yeah, totally. And like, let's not discredit James Murphy's uh, performance on this record. Absolutely uh, James not. Murphy being, being one of my favorite guitarists in, in metal, you know, in general. Uh, just because that dude had this way of way of being like he was in a lot of bands, uh, not for very long. He makes like singular appearances on records, but every time he touches a record, it 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 becomes that much more special. Uh, and you know, like I think you know, we talked about you know before where like in Obituary, he he brought much needed melody and and clarity to that really muddy kind of down tuned sort of sound. But then you you come in, you come into death you know right after leprosy uh, into spiritual healing and you know Chuck is Chuck is starting to come around to a, more of a melodic approach you know to his music but then James Murphy comes in there and that's what James Murphy is about is kind of that that kind of like yeah we can be heavy but we can also be we can also sound really good like we can sound appealing we can we we can release those chemicals in people's brains where whenever they hear us play a melodic solo or something or a melodic lead uh that they just instantly become hooked you know with, with what we're doing uh and so i think james being on that record really really uh it really enhanced it for me even though like i'm i'm a chuck purist so like i'm like yeah whatever chuck wants to do is is always perfectly great perfect you know uh but at the same time like there's no denying that this record wouldn't have been as good as it was uh, without James Murphy on there. And so like his, uh, his input was, was absolutely uh, integral. And I think also, I think in a way he opens Chuck up to a little bit more of a, of a melodic sound of like, dude, we can be heavy. We can be intense. We can do every, you can do everything that you were doing before, but we can now make it sound good in a, in a way that, you know, maybe people aren't going to be expecting. Um, and Chuck carries that on. Uh, even after even after James is out of the band, yeah, you could one could even possibly argue that James Murphy might have helped shift him musically a little bit, and then you know that allowed him to kind of go from there and take in a little bit more of that classical element into human. Oh, human! Well, I'm muted, aren't I? No, I'm not muted. Cool. <laughs> hey, we're live. So stuff like that happens. 1991. Uh, yeah, Human, oh my god, man! Like flattening, flattening of emotions, just like right off the bat, man. Like, I mean, it's it's not. I said this in our in our old death episode where it's like I'll hear a death record, and I'll be like, this is so good, this is as good as it's ever gonna get, and I'm gonna be satisfied with that. And then I hear the next death record, and I'm like, oh, they did it again. Like, how do they? You know, how how does somebody how does somebody hit a home run this many times in a row? Uh, and, and humans even more than that, like like it makes spiritual healing sound like a basic bro kind of record in comparison. And I think a lot of that is because like they so the, pretty much the entire band that was on spiritual healing was gone. It was just Chuck again, uh, all by his lonesome. And so he hires a band of whack jobs like he hires a band that plays like jazz bass and, and you know, and and guys that, that have never listened to a death metal record. Wait a second. Gene Hoagland's not on this album. 
Gene Hoagland is not here yet. He 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 will be arriving here in another record or so. But it was the guys. It was all the guys from Cynic. Just, I mean, just it was the guys checking from Cynic, what, exactly. what we're meaning when we say whack jobs. <laughs> well, Cynic is, Cynic is one of the one of my favorite whack job bands of all time. Like, uh, I could go for another three hours on Cynic. I'm not going to do that to you guys tonight. But like, uh, yeah, like like the melodic sensibility, and it's so funny because like I consider myself like a metal guy. Like I like heavy intense music but like god there's something about the way these guys do melody that just completely blows my mind uh because it sounds otherworldly like it goes beyond just being metal absolutely and, and it becomes something else and this is the first this is the first record where they really start touching on that 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 melodic sense where it actually makes it sound more important than maybe it really is but like they i don't know they hit it in such a way that like um, songs like lack of, lack of comprehension or together is one and stuff. It's just so it's visceral, but it's beautiful at the same time. I didn't yeah. have the words for this on the last record, but something Christian said brought this to my mind. Is death the only metal band that has instrumental hooks, not riffs, instrumental hooks that pull the listener in? I can't think of another band that has that. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, they were definitely pioneers in that. I'm going to have to say that Chuck was the first guy to do extreme music, but put something you could walk away with instrumentally that is fun, that makes you feel good, that makes you feel like, you know, you, you, um, that it was beneficial after you listened to it, I guess is the right way to experience it. And um, and I, I think, man, it, it had to have been Ch just Chuck's need to keep experimenting. Just his need to not be stagnant, to just want to grow as a human being, musically and as a human being. I mean, because on, 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 on human, he really, really went next level, you know, philosophy next level of um human emotions dark human emotions that can appeal to anyone on a normal day um where before you know it was a a more horror niche that he was basing a lot of his lyrics on i think that he he became this person that had very deep thought in his music and, and um I can't think of many other extreme metal bands that did what he did lyrically that early on on such an extreme album. So I think the thing for me, you know, um, kind of talking a little bit, catching up on spiritual healing for me, uh, you know, you guys kind of talked about it. I feel like, and I didn't know who it was, okay. just listening to, uh, listening to the record. The thing, obviously, I loved is like the kind of more use of guitar effects to kind of create a, a fuller sound. Um, that we weren't really necessarily getting on the other stuff on, from spiritual healing. That is, um, it's a thing. I'm kind of already hearing it at this point um, on spiritual healing. Something that I don't. I, none of you guys commented on, and was something that like I noticed right away was that riff in altering the future. Megadeth borrowed that. That was their opening riff to Angry Again. <laughs> like, you're already seeing the influence of this band in a subgenre that's not popular being utilized potentially by their counterparts in the mainstream and having mainstream success with it. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, also, kind of to touch on the last little bit of spiritual healing, I feel like that was really the band kind of enjoying exploring where they can go with a song instead of just having to play you know, at maximum speed at all times, um, you know, moving on to human, I probably going to get some shit for this. Um, strong, hot for teacher vibes on that opening drum beat. Like, oh, oh yeah, for sure. Jesus I'm Christ. Of emotions. Yeah, that's hot for teacher. Yeah. Yeah, but then you hear da, 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 yeah, da, da, no, for sure, and then it immediately leaves. But that's that's hot for teacher. <laughs> Damn it, John, you're you're right. Now here's the other thing I'm gonna bum everyone else out with. John, the joke is not funny if you explain it. Yeah, okay. How about this one? <laughs> is the uh, bass on a uh, Suicide Machine the original Burber Ding? Oh. 
Burn, burn, ding, burn, burn, ding. I don't know. I guess. I guess. Wow. Is that like Primus before Primus was Primus? I, I don't know. It was the meme before the meme. Um, overall, though, Human is probably my runaway favorite album so far from the band. Chuck's voice sounds great. The production and songwriting are solid. This is really what I consider the band firing on all cylinders at this point, putting it all together for a great record. And it's one of those where, you know, Dan has kind of asked a few different times, you know, the, the fun thing sort of, I guess, about me um, listening to this for my first time for most of it is I'm listening to this with 2020 years. So I'm going to say something like, oh, I hear this. And then I have to like I did with the Megadeth riff where I'm like, oh, fuck, this is Megadeth. No, wait, this came out before the Megadeth song. I went and looked. So it's you're seeing the influence that they're having reverse in real time. But the other thing is, too, and like I kind of said at the very, very beginning of all this, where we actually started, this record just is so fucking leaps and bounds from a production standpoint above everybody else, even themselves, that it is one of those where if the band sounded like this, like when everyone tells me that's a legendary band and you were to play me human, I go, oh, I fucking get it. I hear it. I hear it in the production. I hear it in the songwriting. I hear it in musicianship. Like, I fucking get it. I didn't necessarily feel that way until this record. This was the record that really opened my eyes to where I was like, okay, I, I fucking see the hype. I understand why people really say this band is got something that people are still listening to this band 20, 30 years later going, man, what an influential band. And I fucking get it. And that's not always easy to do when you're listening to something well after it's come out. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. It's one of those records that you listen to and it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Uh, it can hit you in a way that, you know, you're not expecting. Uh, I'm not going to give this record the seal of approval and say that it that it's aged extremely well, and that it still sounds new. Uh, it doesn't sound new, but at the same time, you, you will find yourself wondering, like, you why did more bands... John hung up, bro. See? Yeah, I know, right? He's like, <laughs> I'm done. He's like, what'd you say about this rap? I'm done. But yeah, like with Human, like it's one of those records that I, yeah, it's not that I'm going to say that it still sounds new, uh, but it does, it does kind of have this feeling of like anybody that was influenced by this record is doing the right thing. <laughs> and anybody that's not influenced by this record doesn't know anything about music. Uh, and that's a really broad, broad, you know, brush stroke. But I mean, if you're, if you're into heavy music, you're into heavy melodic stuff, um, human has has graced your ears before um and it's where the band really explodes melodically i mean when chuck's like you know what i'm gonna get a fretless bass player uh on this record um uh, and i'm gonna get a bunch of guys that are not really into like chuck is the only death metal like influence on this record even even the drumming is not really is not really a death metal uh influence really I mean, it, it, it has to be that to a certain degree to keep up with the pace, but the melodic sensibility really reigns supreme on this record, and it's the first time where um, I'm sure there were probably some death fans, you know, idiots, that were like, oh, the band's gotten really commercial and sold out, and they got a video on MTV or whatever, like, I'm not going to check them out or whatever, but like, I mean, you have to basically be deaf and, and not really understand what you're hearing to, to discount a record like Human. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody say anything negative about human. It's one of those records that's kind of almost immune to criticism and with good reason. I mean, some, some of the stuff that they, that they pull on this record is ridiculous. Like they they had the instrumental song, uh, which was just like pure melodic, like space metal weirdness. And like, it's so good. It's, it's so good. One of my favorite ones on the album, like Cosmic Sea. Cosmic Sea. Yep. Such a good song. So good. Um, and I love space. I love anything having to do with music in space. Like that's my that's my whole deal. Uh, I listen to a lot of hum records. If that puts it in perspective, but like <laughs> it's, it's one of those. Uh, it's one of those things where like, and I'm like, oh, cool. Like, Death's doing this, doing this type of stuff uh, with with death metal. And yeah, like it's it's absolute classic. I there I could talk about I could talk about human forever. Um, I appreciate that the. Uh, that the vinyl version of it that I just showed on camera a little bit ago has a, uh, a has the death cover of the Kiss song uh, "God of Thunder" on it, and uh, again, it's one of those like I didn't think Chuck was gonna be able to pull this off, but like he absolutely pulled off another classic metal song uh, like it was nothing. And I think that's something that nobody talks about either. Really, is they 
is is the influence of classic metal on Chuck uh, and his guitar playing and then like all of that stuff where he gets a lot of that melodic sensibility from these older bands like Kiss, like Judas Priest, like Iron Maiden and stuff like um, bands like that. I, I have to admit, I have a little bit of trouble listening to because they're not quite heavy enough for lack of a better term they're a little bit more subdued and it's not their fault like i can't expect iron maiden to sound like slayer in 1970 whatever right you know like it's it's that's just not gonna happen but uh but like yeah like the way whenever you hear death do a cover of a classic song like that you realize that like oh wait this song actually is really really incredible the only reason i don't think it's super heavy now is because it may have been limited by the recording technology of the time yeah no i i think Man, I think that's and on the deluxe version on iTunes they have that. Um, they have the God of Thunder on there. And another amazing thing that they have on on the deluxe version is they did sub mixes of the drums uh, with just bass, no guitars, no vocals. I don't know where the idea to do that came out, but when you listen to them, it really, really shines on how talented the bass playing and the drumming was on that album. I'm, I'm almost inclined to wonder if after working with James Murphy, Chuck was like, oh, yeah, working with dudes that get what I'm doing but can kind of like push me to the next level is the right thing to do. And I think maybe he stopped, you know, where before maybe he just had dudes playing with him that were like, whatever you want to do, Chuck, you just, you know, tell us what you want to do, Chuck. Where on Human, perhaps he had these insanely talented musicians that were kind of like James Murphy might have been, helping him grow and helping him experiment with things that he might have not maybe heard before. Because when you hear Human, the essence of the riffs are Chuck Schultz. You know, when you hear the riffs, you could hear how it's Chuck that wrote them, but the way that they're presented is is completely different. And I think he was maybe influenced or driven by the guys he was playing with at the time to take his own songs and kind of grow them, you know? And wh one may wonder if if that album, you know, was, was the album that at least opened people's minds to pro more progressive extreme metal. I think so, because like I wouldn't have ever listened to a band like Gore Guts or or something like that without listening to something like Human, um, because not the Fuel album, uh, the, you know, an album like 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 Death's Human. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, like, I, I do think that like, yeah, I wouldn't have checked out something like Gore Guts or um, like Obscura or, or some of like those those newer bands like Cephalic Carnage, like those types of bands. I would have never been interested in those bands without having human as kind of my like context for that type of music. Cause I would have been like, what is this? It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of weird, like disjointed melodies mixed in with like death metal. And I don't understand it. Like death metal is supposed to sound like this. And death was the very first band that kind of challenged me on that and was like, is death metal supposed to sound like this? Here's an idea of how death metal can sound like whatever we want it to sound like. And it doesn't have to be constrained by, you know, being death metal it can be equally it can be equally heavy and equally um equally melodic and and appealing to people that are not necessarily into death metal uh, so like so yeah, again like uh, yeah i uh i i definitely second that with cephalic carnage like bands like that where they they took what death did on human and they took it to the next level and they just they made it so heavy and so intense uh from like a modern sensibility and so I definitely still hear Echoes of Death like in those newer bands. Is that your like new death metal band, Echoes of Death? Echoes of Death. There you go. <laughs> There's a band name for you. Yeah. Echoes of Death. <laughs> Even a band like Black Dahlia Murder, you, you hear a little bit of that old school death kind of vibe a little bit. Obviously, they're influenced by more modern things and the sounds are different and, you know, the recording and, and technology is different. But um but definitely, man. I mean, what you know, you, you got to wonder, you got to ask yourself, because of the evolution of the band, really what drove Chuck to make such a bold move? Um, I don't know where, how someone along the line maybe said, or maybe he himself said, you know, I've been told there can't be chord progressions in death metal for too long. And don't tell me what should be there because maybe he heard it there you know that's because that's really what um 
what I get from Human is it was Chuck, it was his riffing, but there was more chord progressions. There was more of like, you know, one, seven, six going on, one, six, seven. Um, and obviously a lot more melodic stuff, but I think- What area codes were those? That was uh, Flint, Michigan. Nah, you're sounding like Jost over there. Like when I got stuck with riffs, I'll just start naming area codes and start playing those as riffs. <laughs> no, that's Lansing, bro, that's Lansing. That 517 riff, what do you know about it? <laughs> Start writing riffs like ludicrous. <laughs> Start naming your riffs by area codes and shit. Yep. John, yep. that was a good rhyme, by the way. <laughs> mm-hmm. I got some bars. What do you know about it? He's living in those bars. But uh, yeah, like human, obviously, like, again, it's a record that we could talk about for like 17 hours. Uh, and if you su- su- subscribe to our Patreon, I was say Patreon, $700 a month, we will uh, give you a 19 hour podcast just talking about just talking about uh, death. And we'll we'll bring Christian back. We'll like we'll cut him in on the Patreon money. So like pay for his time to talk for 18 hours about We're- about human. Not you, John. You're not going to be invited. Well, as I say, we already talked about Christian death metal. Oh, we did talk about Christian. I do talk about a lot of Christian death metal on this uh, because some of that stuff's really good. But uh, yeah, so with human again, it's again, you know, this is I'm I'm a one trick pony with this. But like you hear human and you're like, it ain't going to ever get any better than this. Right. This is this is like, you know, this 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 is the this is the album that knows my locker combination, you know, and it's going to every time I listen to it, I'm going to go, oh, you know, like it's always going to it's always going to be there for me. Um, but then, you know, individual thought patterns comes out and you're like, how do they keep doing this? Like, th- like, is this, is this an actual example of a guy that sold his soul to the devil to sound this good? 1993. He didn't. He sold his soul to Gene Hoagland. <laughs> Gene Hoagland was Gene on, on individual thought patterns, right? Gene was on, um, individual thought patterns and symbolic and symbolic. Yeah. So he was on two death records. Uh, and my buddy, uh, my buddy Travis did an interview with Gene Hoagland on his podcast as the story grows a while back. And he was talking about, you know, when he joined death and he was talking about how like, yeah. So like Chuck, Chuck got a hold of me and, uh, he goes, Chuck, uh, basically was like, yeah, I want to do something really cool. And uh, Gene was immediately like, okay, I'm about to sit down and make the most brutal death metal albums ever made with Chuck Schuldner. And it's going to be like super amazing. He's like, and then I talked to Chuck and Chuck was like, yeah, I kind of want to keep doing this melodic thing. <laughs> like, I want to, I want to like, I want to, I want to keep going with this like melodic stuff. And Gene's like, yeah, but like heavy. And he's like, yeah, yeah, of course, heavy. Like, of course, like it's going to be heavy, but like, I want to keep going with this melodic thing or whatever. And Gene was just like, Okay, man, like whatever, whatever you want to do, you know, and, um, and then you get individual thought patterns, which is just one of the most technical and beautiful records that you're ever going to listen to. Uh, but what I think is interesting, and I, and I don't know if this is like a Gene Hoagland influence or not, but it does seem like individual thought patterns picked up, um, kind of picked up the intensity a little bit more even even more so than what you had on human because you had you had a heavier record but in, in equal amount you also had these like super melodic uh hooky songs uh and again but it's not like a sellout like it's not like a yeah so now we're just doing choruses or we're doing you know uh all, all this other stuff like it's still it's still completely legitimate but it's equally heavy equally melodic and they were one of the first bands that i'd ever heard uh, that was able to really balance that throughout multiple records. Because I think after Human, everybody was like, wow, that was a really cool experiment. And now they're going to go back to like, I don't know, like the leprosy sound or something like that. And it just couldn't have been further from the truth. Right. Like, uh, oh, Chuck must just have been high for that. That was cool that Chuck got high for a year and he put out that album. He'll yeah, I mean, we've to- all been there. You know what I mean? We've all been there. But like, <laughs> you know, it's really great that Chuck found himself on Human, you know? Like, <laughs> Dude, and you know what? Something I've never realized James Murphy might have helped him do that, you know? Because before then, you really what happened is Chuck had a bunch of musicians that would probably do whatever he was asking them to do, except maybe the drummer, because I hear in there the drummer kind of adding his own things on the early albums that mm-hmm. aren't the norm of what you would hear on other albums. But 
you know i i imagine it um having musicians around him that played things that he wasn't used to hearing is probably what appealed to him a lot and drove him to the more human kid kept going into individual thought patterns because individual thought patterns is is it, you could basically say it's almost like what spiritual healing was to leprosy individual thought patterns might be the human where he had this two album growth where he didn't completely abandon what he did on the album before but he wanted to take it to the next level and really polish it better maybe do things differently i don't know what he might have been thinking but i would i would have to assume that he was just being influenced by playing with badass musicians and it really drove him to keep digging and keep working hard and you know really trying to find those things that make sense for his band yeah i don't think chuck at any point was just willing to just rest on his laurels and just be like oh man i you know i i'm i found the sound that i'm looking for and i'm comfortable with it and i'm just going to stick with that you know and there's a lot of musicians to do that and honestly they're not wrong you know the the ones that do that where they're like I'm making a decent amount of money off of this. Uh, I'm all, mindful. I'll just keep putting out the same thing. Uh, and that's fine. And like, I don't really have anything against people to do that. But I think with Chuck, it was just kind of a personal thing where he was like, no, I've, I've still got to keep digging and digging and digging and digging and pulling out of myself things that I never thought that I'd be able to pull out. Um, and that really, really shows on a record like individual thought patterns where, you know, he's trying to top human, even though nobody, nobody expected him to do that. Nobody asked him to do that, but it was almost like it was just something that was eating away at him. Like I I've got to, I've got to one up myself, <laughs> you know, I guess in a way. And, um, and I think largely he succeeds on that. I think that, I think that individual thought patterns is just as good of a record as human. Uh, but I also have such an emotional attachment to human that I can't quite give one the edge over the other. Uh, if that makes sense, where like, I, I would just rather have both albums than have to choose one of them, you know? Absolutely. And I think Brandon Small said it best when he talked about Gene Hoagland recording some of the Death Clock records. If I write something that's absolutely crazy, most people can't play it, but Gene can. So I expect that was at least a portion of Chuck's motivation to have these musicians on this record because if I write something absolutely insane or if I've got something in my head that the average musician couldn't necessarily pull off, I know if I have these guys playing with me, I can at least get it on tape, get it out of my head, and then maybe I can push this genre just a little bit further. It was almost like he found a bunch of dudes to encourage him and be like, yeah, Chuck, go! Yeah, Chuck, go! Absolutely. Where but they was, weren't yes men going- either. The, the dudes in the band before might have just been like, hey, man, we'll, what do you need? We'll do whatever you need, you know? Yeah. Like, I think it was one of those, like, he was, he had a team of people that believed in what he was doing. But that isn't necessarily like a bunch of yes men either that are like, I think, I, and, and I don't know this for sure, but I think that people challenged Chuck on this record. And they were like, yeah, man, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Um, why don't we try it like this? Or I'm going to add this here, or I'm going to try to do this. And um, I think, and I don't know necessarily because obviously I'd never have a chance to talk to Chuck again, unfortunately. Um, but if I did, you know, uh, one of the questions I'd ask him is, or not necessarily ask him, but even people around him would have been like, how hard was Chuck to work with as far as like, did he just come in and say, this is the way it's going to be, you know, and, and, and move on? Or was he, was he open to kind of more of like a, our iron sharpens iron sort of situation where, he surrounds himself with amazing musicians uh, and then they can kind of, they can kind of feed back on him and tell him like, yeah, do you, do you guys think that this was a good idea? Do you think this is something that we should do? What we shouldn't do? Um, and I really, that's one of the biggest mysteries that unfortunately we're never going to have an answer to is whether or not like he was super collaborative. I mean, I guess we could get Gene Hoagland on the show uh, and ask him. Uh, so, you know, maybe we'll try that at some point, but um, yeah, get right but on it, that for me. Yeah, at this particular moment, it's one of those questions that just remains unanswered. Like, did Chuck did Chuck just show up with this? <laughs> you know, or or was it a huge collaborative effort? I guess that's that's my question for the next three records or next two records. I think I think I would have to assume because the riffs are so uniquely Chuck, even on individual thought patterns, even on human. 
that I'd have to kind of assume that I think he was doing the bulk of the riff writing. But what was what might have been occurring was in the jamming and showing the riffs, jamming with the other musicians. I think they might have been so talented that it just pulled different things out of them. You know, it brought him to different places that he wasn't going before. I, I'd, but I'd have to assume that because he was such a, almost like one, not a one man thing. He always had people in the band that all represented the, the thing he was doing, but his style was so unique. I guess it's the right way to word it, that it still sounds like him, uniquely like him. Not like anything, not like somebody else came in to write for him or write too much with him, but just came in to really shake up what he was writing. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree. I think they all just got together and he was like, hey, I wrote these songs and they all just kind of vibed on it where they're like, cool, yeah, I'll throw this in or whatever. And I think, I think that, you know, he had to have been open to kind of this idea of not necessarily changes to the songs, but just this, like, I'm going to do this and it's going to make it sound cool. It's going to give it a unique flavor you know, and um, then that gets that starts getting really, really interesting whenever we move over to symbolic because symbolic is where the band, for lack of a better term, decides to go full prog metal, you know, like just full on like we're on a completely different planet now. 1995. We're not constrained to one genre anymore. We're like. We're just gonna go all. We're gonna go all over the place, and you're gonna love it. We're gonna make epic ten minute songs, and you know, just just completely go crazy. Um, and yeah, like symbolic is absolutely one of those records where you're like, where, how are they doing this? Like again, you know, I keep asking this question: How are you able to take what you did before and somehow make it into something even more unique than what, what you were doing before because individual thought patterns is a unique record. Symbolic is even more unique. Yeah. It's, it's almost like definitely more progressive. The time signatures are a little bit more, uh, experimental. Yeah. He was, I, I guess it, it still, I mean, it still sounds, if anything, Symbolic, you could almost say, is the more different sounding album. Where maybe he wanted to write different kinds of riffs, perhaps, and was really digging for a different angle or approach. Um, and it is an incredibly complicated album, you know? It was, I remember when I first heard it, as much, and I was a huge fan of human and individual thought patterns, when I first heard it, it was almost like I had to get used to it. Like I, I had to get used to how progressive and different it felt, but but it is it is absolutely an, an album that um, is incredibly massive and talented. It sounds great. Um, it's walking a little bit more towards that um, organic kind of sound that I think you hear more on the sound of perseverance. But it feels like the band at the time was also searching for new ways to evolve the audio also, or the way the band sounded, the tones, not just the songwriting. Um, and that's that's kind of like what I take away from Symbolic. It was an experiment into tones with them and into more, using more progressive elements. Um, I wonder, I, I don't know, were they, were they doing a lot of touring around that time? I think that was like around the time where they, Chuck stopped touring or something like that. I'm not 100 percent sure. So I'm not sure if he stopped touring necessarily, but I do think that like this was a time period where Chuck was starting to become kind of done with death metal. You know, I think he he kind of sailed that ship as far as he could sail it. Because I mean, by the time you get to symbolic, it's hard to justify death as a death metal band. You know, like you go back, you go back to Scream Bloody Gore Leprosy, like, yeah, those records are classic. They're death metal staples. They're they're what everybody listens to. But by the time you get through like human and individual thought patterns and symbolic, you're basically listening to a prog metal band, but the vocalist screams still. <laughs> you know, like and I think I think to a certain extent Chuck was starting to feel kind of somewhat limited by the confines of death metal. I mean, like a, a genre that he more or less helped create. Um, and I think that he he was starting to feel musically stifled a little bit. Like, I've kind of taken death metal as far as I can take it. 
So when when you're writing a record like Symbolic, it's like you're not even writing that with death metal in mind uh, at that point. You're you're writing just what your influences are. Uh, and if you listen to Symbolic, you hear influences from classic metal. Uh, you hear influences from thrash. You hear a little bit of a little bit of of death's kind of signature brand of death metal. And uh, Chuck's vocals change uh, on Symbolic. They become more higher pitched. They become a little bit more um, as I like to, as I like to call them the Skeletor vocals. Um, he goes he goes way 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 high with them. And I think in a way that was his way of kind of differentiating him, differentiating himself from all these death metal bands. Uh, whose vocals were all very like guttural and and deep and, and in your face, and I think he was kind of kind of jiving more towards a classic metal sound. So he's like, I have to still scream all of the vocals because if I don't, I can't put the name Death on the record. <laughs> you know, people are gonna be people are gonna be upset if I don't if I don't if I call it a Death record and there's like clean singing. And I think that's something that nobody really really talks about and something that's not really shown on any of death's recorded material is Chuck's clean singing. Uh, you can kind of hear it a little bit on some of the stuff, um, on some of the stuff that was on, um, like the demo tracks and stuff that was, that was released later on with the re-releases of the albums. You can hear a little bit of Chuck's clean singing and Chuck actually has a good singing voice. You know, he's not like some world class, like vocalist, you know, uh, like melodic singer, but he actually is, decent like i mean it's he could put that stuff on the record and people would be like oh that's really cool but i think if you look at the if you look at the atmosphere at that time i think people that were death metal fans they were not interested in clean singing <laughs> they were not interested in melodic vocals that um, and in 1995 if you have been listening to this band for the past eight years i don't think you'd be happy with this record it's not very it's not really death metal. It's a little slowed down and takes some of those classic metal influences. And yeah, if that's what Chuck wanted to do that day, then that's what death is going to do. But looking back on the discography, knowing how many different directions this band goes, it makes sense that even at their most classic metal sounding, it still sounds like death. It still sounds like Chuck Schuldner and Gene Hoagland obviously has his hands on the drums, so it's like you have above-average musicians creating what, for most people, would be well above average metal, but it might not be the most complicated thing that Chuck Schuldner can do. It's like saying to the violinist, yeah, you can play Flight of the Bumblebee, but why would you want to play Bluegrass? <laughs> Sorry. Did I break you with that one? <laughs> you broke me with that one. You, bro <laughs> you, you broke my professional music critic uh, face there. But like, uh, yeah, like you could tell that there were there were cracks in the seams on this record. I think it's a great record. I love it. Uh, but it's not my favorite of the last two death records. Um, and I think this was also around the time where, where Chuck essentially disbanded death. Uh, he was like, OK, Symbolic is going to be our last record and we're we're pretty much done with it uh and then he started working on a side project called control denied uh and i actually have the control denied record it's called the uh fragile art of existence and um it sounds like uh it well it sounds like like symbolic and like uh and like uh sound of perseverance uh they just he just hired a, a melodic singer like a bruce dickinson style you know a melodic metal singer uh, to sing all the songs and um it's really interesting hearing the demo versions of those songs because it's got chuck singing you know which i think is really really fun to hear uh but you know he hired another singer for that and he basically was just like yeah like we're gonna put out this control denied record and it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be all these things and i'm gonna move away from death metal now and i'm gonna become you know a, a classic heavy metal uh guitarist which i think might have been chuck's dream all along you know the reason why he picked up a guitar in the first place was to be a classic metal uh guitarist and then to play some shred solos and you know play uh play all that cool stuff but like uh something happened and i, I wish i had the actual history here um in front of me but essentially once once they were done with the symbolic uh kind of tour cycle and, and all of that stuff 
that they put out the Control Denied record, there was still kind of a push to put out another death record. And so what's interesting about The Sound of Perseverance is that that record is basically made by the band Control Denied. 1998. It's not death in the in the traditional sense, other than the fact that Chuck decided since it was a death record that he was going to screen the vocals again, just like he did on uh, on Symbolic. I've been talking too long. What do you What do you guys got? <laughs> I didn't even know that he had a side project around then. I'm gonna after we're done, I'm gonna have to go and look it up, dude. Dude, it's so good. It's so good. Control denied. Uh, I think you can listen to the whole record on YouTube too. You know, um, but it's. Uh, I got it. I actually got the Control Denied record uh, for Christmas, uh, maybe three years ago, and it was like my my most coveted Christmas present because it was a basically, for lack of a better term, it was another deck record. It was another death record that I hadn't heard. You know, yeah, yeah, sure, it's got melodic vocals, but like at this point in my life, I just don't even. Um, yeah, like uh, at this point in my life, I can't even like imagine anything any a greater present than to have listened to all the death records and then hear this other one and i don't care that the vocals are melodic like i'm i'm kind of beyond that as far as as far as that sort of stuff goes uh because it's all for me it's at this point it's all about the music the progression and you can you can hear kind of that 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 change with death and um that you get between like symbolic and sound of perseverance and that's actually a really good comment uh that i want to that i want to highlight again real quick uh that just came through they say nuclear nuclear blast said you can do your control denied record but you have to give us one more death record if that's true that makes total sense from a record label's perspective is they're like death everybody wants another death record we'll let you put this other record out like your pet project we'll let you put that out but we need another death record and so he just goes in with the same guys that did control denied and he's like all right we're gonna basically just do a control denied record but i'm gonna scream on it <laughs> you know uh, and Sound of Perseverance, in a certain sense, you could just discount it as that, like just another Control Denied record. But like, oh my God, like what it well, I mean, Sound of Perseverance is like Scavenger of Human Sorrow, Bite the Pain, Spirit Crusher. Like those first three songs, it's just like bam, 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 bam. And maybe it's like paint by numbers for Chuck at this point, but it sounds so good. His voice sounds so good. Um, how high pitched his voice gets like um i wouldn't i wouldn't be into black metal if it wasn't for listening to sound of perseverance and hearing those higher pitched vocals and being like you know what this is actually really really cool it's not a guy doing a fake a fake like classic metal thing it's like it's like really intense and raw and his voice is like so clear and the lyrics are like so biting like this is this is like full-on chuck being like philosophical and being like oh my god these songs are this is you know scavenger of human sorrow just talking about like those piece of shit people in your life that like no matter anything you do all they care about is watching you fail this is you also know? the most brisk chuck's vocals ever sound so good yeah definitely he had i'm gonna say he had the biggest vocal tone change on this album um it's definitely more more like uh, creatorish. I want to say maybe he, maybe he had he, like Millie. He figured, oh, I'm a creator fan. Let me do this thing a little bit more differently. But um, but it was such a different time in music. I think that that's why Sound of Persevering is Sound of Perseverance sounds differently, and it has a different kind of vibe. You know, his vocal tone is different. The snare sound is completely different than what you've heard on a death album. And um, and it was just Chuck, Chuck not being stagnant, not able to just stay still and do the same thing over and over again. Um, when when you were talking about, you know, him being able to sing, I kind of started thinking, man, he was so talented. I find it hard to believe that he's such a good heavy vocalist and such a good guitar player and such a good songwriter that he would have trouble learning how to sing like that doesn't you know grasp with me because he was so talented that i'd have to assume that he'd be able to sing somehow and you know he he just didn't put like you said he just didn't put it on the album because it was death and it wasn't right for what he was doing but um but definitely his vocal tone changed a lot on this album i wonder if it came naturally or if he actually like made a conscious effort to really really switch 
how he vocalized. That's one of the things I always wondered. Did he say to himself, uh, I consciously want completely different vocal kind of approach on this album. Not approach, but a vocal tone on this album. Or was it just a natural progression and he just wound, him, wound up there, you know? Which happens to musicians. You go on this musical evolution thing and then you wind up at this thing and you really don't know how you got there, but it's where you are and you like it at that moment. And in my ignorant youth, that was my question as well. Knowing how unexpected Chuck's passing was, I wondered, was this vocal selection declining health? Or had he just been doing these harsh vocals for 10 years and this is just what his voice sounds like now? I don't think so. I think this is obviously like a conscious decision to go in that higher because like I can tell you as a vocalist myself that like going in that higher register is not as easy as going into the deeper guttural register. I mean, I guess it depends on how guttural you want to go. But like um, when I was when I was doing screaming vocals, I'm doing the higher pitch stuff always took a much harder toll on my throat than doing the kind of deeper stuff because like the deeper stuff I can pull that from the pit of my stomach and just raise it out you know whereas with the higher pitch stuff you have to do a lot more with your throat to to get it to get it to the exact pitch that you want it to be at um and obviously I'm not the most like um prolific vocalist on this chat right now but like it is one of those things where like I uh you know I definitely had a lot of trouble uh pulling those higher pitch vocals out and so I don't think it's I don't really I don't think that it's a, a sign of declining health uh, by any means. I think he was screaming harder than he ever did. And one of my favorite things about that vocal style is uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the uh, the Death and Raw live in L.A. DVD, um, but it's an entire live concert of Chuck during the Sound of Perseverance F, uh, era, playing like a bunch of old Death songs from the catalog, and he's doing them in those higher pitched vocals. Uh, like he does on the sound of perseverance and I, I i gotta say like i really really enjoy it like i think he he really came into his own here because like if i'm being real i've never thought that chuck's vocals were they weren't outrageously spectacular like it's better as far as like death metal vocals go you know he definitely set the precedence on scream bloody gore with that like guttural growly type of vocal but i think that later on in their career he kind of settled for more of like a thrash metal uh, like louder shouted vocal, almost like a hardcore, like a hardcore bark. Um, whereas you had death metal bands rising up around them that were doing like like the Chris Barnes, like ultra guttural, you know, screams. Um, so I think this was Chuck's way of like, really, I think he really kind of spread his wings here and did something a little bit different than what we were expecting um, because we weren't expecting it. It was kind of like his final way of being like, yeah, I'm going to do something that you're not expecting right now. Uh, and I think you're gonna love it. I mean, the high pitched insanity of his, of the chorus of Spirit Crusher, when he's just like Spirit Crusher, I can't even get that high. But like he he's so he goes so high pitched uh, with that Spirit Crusher hook that like there's almost there, there's nothing else to compare it to. And then whenever you compare it to what he did on the cover of Painkiller, th- that was the cover of Painkiller just blows my mind because Chuck was so. He number one, he was so into it. You could tell that like it was one of his favorite songs, like of all time, and how he just puts it out like he screams, and then he goes into that like metal, like like Rob Halford, like you know where you're like yelling at the top of your voice, but then you like kind of like wave it out a little bit. Like he was doing that with screams, and he was mixing extreme vocals and classic metal vocals together uh, in a way that I've never heard anybody else replicate. Because, like, in in the metal world, even today, it's like, okay, this is my heavy vocal and this is my melodic vocal. And the way he was able to just combine both of them together makes my throat hurt whenever I listen to it. Just because I know how hard that must have been for him to do. So to answer your question in a really long and roundabout way, Joe, uh, no, I don't think it was declining health. I think that he was at peak performance when he was doing this stuff. Let me so ask the like qualified the guy in the room. Yeah, Let's ask the guy that's actually a vocalist, like, what's going on with that. Or he was probably, you might be right in that a lot of bands at that time were going for the deeper, more guttural, lower vocals. And he might have felt, well, I'm not going to do that. 
you know, and, and, and it's 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 the noble musicianship thing to do is to not just follow the trend just because, you know, to kind of test the waters and, and push the boundaries more is the, you know, it's 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 the more human thing to do. Um, I see what you did there. Yeah, it is, <laughs> some of those high pitches are hard to sing. Some of those high pitches are hard to sing, and it's and not and it's not to take away from from what he was doing on on the records before that, because you know the vocals on Human are not easy to sing either. You know the vocals on, on individual thought patterns and, and symbolic they're not easy to sing either. It's just, um, yeah, he pushed himself in a different way. He, he just decided he wasn't going to do the same thing. I imagine. Yeah, I agree. Like he just wanted to differentiate himself from from what everyone else was doing, uh, and I think he did he did that extremely well. Like I said, that that death and raw live in LA DVD. I love hearing him sing like like zombie ritual and pull the plug like in those in those more higher pitch vocals. It adds a lot, and it, like as a fan, as a fan, I'm the kind of fan that likes to listen to like different versions of songs. Like I like hearing kind of like what was different. That's why that's what I love about those re-release records is that like they have so much extra material of like different versions of the songs, like early versions and and like mid-tier versions, and then like ultimately like you know demo versions of what the final song was going to be. Like I lo- I eat all that shit up. I love it. Um, and yeah, the, like there's there's no shortage of that type of material with death. And um, to hear him play those songs live with that, you know, and the crowd just going nuts like the entire time, it just really goes to show you, like, I'm surprised, like, and I think this is something that only existed kind of in the older music music industry, was how much fans could latch on to something. And when somebody did something different or they did something else, that fans didn't immediately just go find another band that was doing the thing that they liked. But they they were more willing to stick with Chuck throughout the changes and throughout all of that stuff. Um, it's just it's just mind blowing to me looking at it from modern eyes, where you know music fans unfortunately are a little bit more fickle these days. And it's you can always go find a band that's still doing that thing that you want them to do. You know, um, whereas with Death, I feel like the fans were always fully engaged and were ready to kind of take on whatever. Um, whatever changes there were like they were ready for it they were good for it um and i think that's something that was only truly captured uh with a band like death that changed so much over their career but still maintained their fan base fairly well like i'm sure there's some people that were like oh i couldn't stand it after they changed from leprosy but like that's like what like eight people <laughs> you know everybody else was fully on board john you've yeah. been quiet for a while what do you think about this record uh yeah i Honestly, don't really like this record. Um, uh, as a whole, honestly, I mean, it's it's been kind of... <laughs> it's funny to hear you guys talk about these last three records and, and talk them up, and I honestly couldn't disagree more. Um, it's... Uh, we're going to go back to Symbolic. Um, actually, no, I'll go all the way back to individual thought patterns. With as much as I loved Human, I felt like that record was a regression. I can't necessarily point to any one thing that makes this is bad, but it. See, man, I started saying all those negative things, and Joel had to cut off your video. I did. I I, I, I had to just cut the internet off and say no more, John. All right. I was gonna say I felt like with symbolic, um, there are some instances where I can feel the band is clearly evolving, but then I also feel like at times it's a regression back to the old ways. Chuck vocals don't sound as strong to me, uh, not like they did with Human. And I feel like uh, there are moments where that band from Human is still on the record. Crystal Mountain, for example, really fucking great song. Um, I think as a whole symbolic, the first half of the record was not very, didn't really wow me. Uh, The second half of the record, though, starting from basically, you know, Judgment, Crystal Mountain, that's a really great one to punch. Missing Throat, while not a bad song, I feel like Crystal Mountain should have been the lead into Perennial Quest, which honestly, Perennial Quest is probably my favorite death song. Period. Um, Asley Dying totally stole that song, that riff, that double time riff uh, at the end of uh, Perennial Quest uh, for Within Destruction. So it goes to speak to the legacy and the the, uh, impact that the band has had. And moving on to Sound of Perseverance... Chuck's vocals honestly just took me out of this. I don't really like the high pitch screech. 
Um, it's part of the thing in death metal that I really don't like. Um, I think I me, mean, yeah, just don't like it. It's not a, not a thing I'm into. Um, and you know, that's, that's either going to be the, the thing that with adding me to this show, um, that's either going to be lead to interesting conversations between myself, the guests, Dan, Joe, whatever. Um, but I make no bones. I never listened to this band. Um, so I'm listening to everything with 2020 years or 2021 now. And honestly, humans set the bar so fucking high for me that these last three just really were very underwhelming. Um, I just couldn't connect with them the way that I could with human. And I don't know. It, it's really, it's really for me, it's really a shame because I had the highest hopes going forward from human on and everything just let me down for one reason or another. It didn't have that consistency that I was looking for. So honestly, like this was one where it's like, you kind of were climbing, climbing, climbing. And then where I thought we'd keep going, we just, and there was no, we, it was just a, ugh, that's, that's how we are. That's where we're at with this band. Um, well, so definitely I, human set the bar pretty high. Human is my favorite death album as well. Same. It, it just, it, it said, the, it really did set the bar high for sure. And it's and it one of, it might've been, he might've been his most experimental musically in, during the human era. That's why maybe, you know, it kind of appeals to you the most as well as you like all sorts of different kinds of music and, you know, you, you can appreciate musicians that experiment, really, is what it comes down to. But I, but I, do, I do see what Dan was saying, where most of the Death fans maybe at the time felt like, oh, what the hell is this? You know, what are all these so, things? I, I guess that's actually a question I have for, for all of you. It's a note I literally wrote for my for one of my at last questions. So as someone who never listened to this band, not in any like I hopped on on human and I went forward or I hopped on here, like wherever my beginning point was, I don't have that. So I have no frame of reference. I have no nostalgia attached to this band. I'm literally listening to them as they exist currently. After human was actually was human a record where fans of the band were like, oh, like, did, do people feel like human is the misstep or do people feel like human is actually the aha moment? This is the band finally realizing what they can be and moving forward. Like, it's like on individual thought patterns. I kept going, did the fan get a lot or did the band get a lot of backlash? And that's why it sounds kind of like a regression because the bands were like, we want the old death. We don't want that human sound. And it just it makes me makes me wonder like listening to these last three records after how great human was and how much we have all sucked the dick of that fucking record am i the outlier i, mean, I know i have no for sure and it's like am i the outlier in thinking that because of how great human is i don't think these last three are as great at all because of how great human is or and am i the norm or am i the outlier because a lot of people were like oh it went back to more of what we liked about the band and human was the outlier it's a good question to ask what kind of vibes was Chuck at the time getting when he put out Human from like the metal scene. It is a good, and I imagine the musicians were all like, dude, this is next level shit. Whatever you're doing, you're onto something. Um, but I could see how some of like the old school fans, it's, you know, melody wasn't their thing. And, and you, it still happens nowadays. Like some fans don't like, there are fans that don't like singing at all. They only like music with screaming but um but i would have to guess it wasn't a lot of people like dan said maybe what was it like eight ten people but some of their fans some of the people maybe they didn't sell as many albums as they were hoping to sell and they felt uh let's just you know not experiment too much if it's not going to take us to where we think it's going to take us or something like that I, I don't think that chuck was anyone to be interested in the success of things but i do feel that he wanted to to be a musician that is looked up to for doing things that are interesting and taking music genres in different directions so you know i i i wonder if he felt some resentment after experimenting so much with melodic stuff and decided he needed to add a little bit more of the roots 
you know, element in the riffing where he's not experimenting as much with melodic stuff because it, it, it is Sound of Perseverance doesn't experiment with chord progressions as much and with um, ambient things. I think is it's a good way to describe it. Also, I'm human. I'm gonna take a stab at it. I think, I think there probably were fans. I mean, just based on every other band that I've ever listened to in my life, there's always gonna be fans that are gonna be pissed off whenever you change. Uh, I'm guilty of it. You know, just if you listen to this show, there I'm I'm wildly inconsistent in that some bands can change, and I give them a free pass, and I say no, the change was amazing, and I loved it, and it was great. And then there's other bands. I was like, why did you change? Don't you understand that we're your fans, and we pay your bills, and all you know, like all that stuff. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, it's wildly inconsistent, and I have no problem admitting that. Um, it just is what it is. At the end of the day, my opinion doesn't matter. It just matters whether you like the music or not, really. But like, like. With death, I think that there probably was a certain amount of fans that probably went away. Like as soon as, as soon as the band had a video on MTV, there's already going to be fans that just feel like they got in on the ground level, and that they knew about this awesome thing called death before anybody else did. God, uh, and they're gonna, yeah, and they're going to stick to that, and nobody's going to, and you know, uh, and then once that band gets more than a certain amount of fans, then it's like. Oh, well, I, you know, I'm not really into that because it's popular or whatever, but like human was the album where death became a band's band. If you played guitar or you played bass or drums, or you were a singer, you latched on to human because it was so much more than what death metal kind of offers you as a genre. Uh, it's, 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 it's next level stuff. So I think, I think in Chuck's mind, number one, I don't think Chuck was really even thinking about what, what, whether fan, what fan expectation was or anything. And there's nothing wrong with that because if you, if you bow to fan expectation too much, then you end up becoming like what, like a slayer where you just play the same thing, you know, over, over, or like an ACDC, you know, slayer and ACDC are great bands, but they're not like known for their variety. You know, sure. they're, they're not known for being, um, you know, to, for upsetting whatever the status quo is. So I think in a case like death, I think the fans that I, this is a horrible way to say it, but I think that the fans that mattered stuck around and the guys that were just like, you know, the guys or girls that stuck around or that didn't stick around. I mean, I think that they just went and they found a band that played death that sounded like death on screen, bloody gore or spiritual healing or uh, leprosy. And they just stuck with that. And that was what they enjoyed. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can't expect no musician can expect the fan to stay through the whole career. You know, I think that's, I think that's always, I think that's one of the things that that really separates musicians out is that some musicians are like, Oh no, I need to do what the fans want. But then other ones are just like, I'm going to do the thing that I want to do. And I'm sorry if you didn't like it, but I'm going to move on. You know, I'm going to move on from it. I'm just going to keep doing what, what makes me happy. Uh, And I think that there's definitely a place for both types of approaches uh, in music. I think, I think some people, make that call where they're like, no, I care really about the fans. And that's also not to say that people that go in a more experimental direction don't care about the fans, you know, but I think that like you reach a certain point where you're like, you're either on board with what we're doing or you're not. And I can't force you to become, I can't force you to be on board. Uh, but you know, I appreciate if you did stick it out. And I think Chuck, Chuck did just really didn't care. Uh, you know, I think it wasn't like, I don't care that I have fans. Uh, but I think it was one of those, like, I'm going to keep just pushing myself and doing more different things. So like, that's where you and I disagree. I think John a little bit is that I don't hear that regression on individual thought patterns. I do think that the record does get a little heavier at times. It's a little bit more extreme than maybe uh, human was, but I also think that that was also just like bringing new blood into the band and that, that, that new blood having an expectation of this band that was maybe different than what the lineup on human had. Uh, so they they approached it a little bit differently, but um, but as far as I'm concerned, death just gets better and better and better. Um, Sound of Perseverance, I'll listen to probably first whenever I'm thinking about this band. So like, but that's just my my opinion, man. It's all opinions, and I don't think that your opinion is invalid. Hearing the band for the first time and feeling that way because that's not the order that I listened to the band originally. I got into Sound of Perseverance and Individual Thought Patterns first, and then I moved, and then I moved backwards. So in your case, you started with Scream Bloody Gore and moved on. So there's not really a way to quantify whether one opinion is 
somehow more informed, <laughs> you know, than, than another one. That's <laughs> well, not, I think that's not what we try to do on this show either. We don't like that's why we don't rank albums with like a with like a number system or something like that is it's all purely subjective. Well, I think that's kind of the interesting thing about this show and something why when approaching at least the, the first handful of episodes that I'm doing with you guys is there's a band we're going to talk about in like three months. It's a band that I had been following for a very long time and is one of those where I've realized I'm positioned for one of the first times doing this show where I'm going to go, oh, but like this is where everyone kind of came on. This was the mainstream record. And I totally get why some people will will hate it or love it. But and then when everyone kind of fell off on the mainstream and then they kind of go more back to what they were. I'm going to go and you guys might not like it. And I'm going to go, oh, no, 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 no. But this is where this band really came into their own again. So that's without giving away that band. That's the thing that I had to realize about this, like with the last three death records after human is I was like, I know that that's my reaction to this band currently. But I know when we go to the other band, I'm going to be exactly like you where I go, oh, but here's the beauty of what they've done and how they've changed or gone back to or, you know, whatever. And that's kind of the one thing that's interesting about music. It's about all of this that we we do on this show is I can kind of poo poo on this after you guys have all been like super stoked on these last three records. And I totally get it's me. And those are my opinions. And that's okay. Just like your guys' opinions are yours. Something I have consistently tried to do since joining this and listening to bands in genre not typically into and won't go out of my way to listen to is I don't want to negate anyone else's opinions on a band or a style or a genre because that's not fair. We all love music and there's something in it that makes us feel something. And at the end of the day, just because I didn't feel what you guys did doesn't negate that experience for you and it doesn't negate my experience. Somewhere in the middle is hopefully kind of how everyone may feel. Maybe there's someone watching this, like I've been reading the comments and I love the fact that everyone is so pro death and has so much more knowledge on this band than I do. Um, you know, Dan has kind of been that person for me where I go to him and go, well, you know, I'm kind of feeling this, or is this something that's been going on? Or what was it like when, uh, wherever you came on to, how did you feel about this? You know, I'm trying to gain the perspective without just going and reading reviews online. Like I want to do, and letting someone else's opinion necessarily inform how I think I should feel and giving a quote unquote disingenuous review of how I felt about that. This is the the fun part of doing this podcast is, you know, as I'm listening to all of you go like, I love this record. And I knew that that was going to be the experience for everybody and that I was going to be the outlier. But I also wasn't afraid to voice my opinion and go, hey, look, this is where I'm at with it. And I know that I don't have the history as all of you guys do or all of whoever the fact will have. So you guys can sit there, you people can possibly message me or whatever and go, oh, well, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You're absolutely right. I don't because I don't listen to this genre, but I, it would almost be akin for all of you potentially to come and start talking about hip hop. And I would know so much more than all of you. And I know that, but I'm not going to negate your opinions because I don't feel they're validated because of how you feel about something. And ultimately, that is one of the few things about this, this specific genre of music that I sometimes have a hard time with is it is tropey and everyone is such an elitist about things and they're not willing to let anyone who has a differing opinion speak their opinion and actually go, that's fair. And I do really like the fact that at least this in discography discussion feels like a safe space to have a differing opinion and we're not going to rip on each other for it. Welcome so, to discography discussion and discussmetal.com, John, where you can express your opinion and disagree with Dan Terry all day long. Well, I mean, I can disagree. Like, <laughs> there's definitely some shit you say sometimes where I'm like, what the fuck are you even talking about? But like, it's fine because as we have all talked, there are some things where you're like, I don't care if my seems out of left field. It's how I feel. Absolutely right. And that's the thing that's great about music. We can discuss it. We can debate it. We can do whatever. But I think ultimately, as long as as long as you're not coming into it with a negative approach and just being like, well, I don't fucking like this because I don't like it and fuck all of you. And here's my opinion. And I'm right. Then we can have a discourse. And I feel like this is one of the few shows where we can do that. Like I clearly kind of shit on three records. All of you really love. And you guys aren't shitting down my throat right now going like, wow, the fuck can you feel that way? You're letting me speak and you're letting me have my opinion. And you're saying it's even valid. 
Oh, that's John, right. check your check your DMs, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. We already went through it. <laughs> we already went through it this week. We're gonna um, go through it. But it, it's a thing where I feel like that's gonna be the one thing for a lot of the, a lot of these episodes this year, where I'm excited to kind of either see. And you know what? And I'll start the final thoughts because I know we got to wrap this episode yeah, up. Yeah, we, we do. We, we're, we're so here's, here's basically my final Yeah, here's my final thought for, for Death. Death is one of those bands that I'd never listened to. Everyone talks about in this legendary sense. Listening to the discography, Death, see how this band is influential to not only metal, progressive metal, thrash metal, so many different genres within the umbrella of metal. I totally get it. I referenced an Asley Dying song that they fucking ripped off the, a riff of Deaths. I referenced Megadeth who ripped off a fucking Death riff. And it's one of those that you can't listen to this and hear those and go, well, I don't hear where they're the influential band that everyone talks about. So if that's the case and I hear that, then it does make me see that this is a very influential band to so many people in so many different kinds of genres. Unfortunately for me, this isn't a just gangbusters discography it really is human and a couple of songs on each record where i'm like that's a great song that's a great song the rest eh. but like that's at least what i'm taking away from this week's on the show is now i have some other songs that where when people talk about this band i feel like i can at least be included in the conversation versus going i don't know it seems kind of daunting i don't know if it's going to live up to the expectation i don't even want to listen to it and that's kind of my final thought is there's something here for everybody, regardless of what style of metal you like. And I can see the influence on this band, even all these years later. Christian, what about you? Final thoughts on death. Um, final thoughts on death, man. Huge impact on the extreme music scene. Who knows where extreme music would have wound out without somebody like Chuck, you know, pushing boundaries and really ruffling up ideas that are out of the norm. Um, and the, the one thing, cause I mean, like you said, everything, everything that could be said about death has been said, you know, because people are that much in love with the band. They understand what they did. And I agree with John, not every record was as intense as some were. That's usually the case with all bands. You know, you get one album that's couple albums that might touch you on a certain level and then maybe a couple albums won't but those are the ones that appeal to somebody else or something like that but um the one thing that i'd have to say that i really really appreciated about death outside of the music because obviously everything about the music has already been said was that chuck in his own way was an anti-rock star he wasn't he, he, he was um not about the lifestyle, you know, but really about the music, how he sees himself in the music, what can he offer musically, um, and how precise the music is, you know, because I feel like every time that Death, that Chuck, you know, wrote an album, he, he was very precise with what he was trying to do. And, um, and I, I just really appreciate that he focused on the music, on just being a normal dude that's in a music scene that came from Florida. He didn't need the glitz and the glamour. He wasn't about the party life. Um, he was really just about... <laughs> Technical difficulties. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, that's funny. There he is. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> you kicked me out. I don't know. It's we're really, not, it's we're really live. This is real life. <laughs> it was like it was like. Listen, I don't like what you fucking saying. All right. <laughs> no, I, I was into it. I was I was watching, and then I I sat there and stared at the screen for like thirty seconds, and I was like, "What's the next part? What's oh, the next man. part? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. What what happened?" <laughs> No, yeah, I just appreciate that he was really a dude that was all about the music, you know? And even when you see his mannerisms, you know, when, in interviews and stuff like that, he was a highly influential figure. Just because he wasn't this rock star type dude doesn't mean he wasn't highly influential in his way of being, you know? And I think that he was, 
his personality type in extreme music led the way to not having to be the silver theatrical thing and, and having it be fine if you're just a normal human being that's really into music and um, and likes experimenting and you know growing yourself as a musician, which is really what he was. It wasn't about the theatrics or the persona or the you know the the visual impact he wanted to have on people. It was really about the music and and who he was as a person. And I. I, I Admire that. Death is one of my favorite bands to listen to that I don't listen to every single day. I listen to Death and hear something new every time because it has a quality to it that mostly does not stick with me. There are songs, there are riffs. Everything is here for me to go back to as a fan. But it stays fresh enough in my mind that when I listen to it, I have to listen to it. And there was a comment earlier on from WYL2K about if Frank Zappa made a death metal record. (laughs) Same thing about that guy. If you listen to it every single day, you might get it eventually, but you'd have to keep listening to it. He kept it fresh. He kept it unique and he kept it seemingly random, but it all made sense to him. And I think Chuck Schuldner does that for death i think this stands on its own in thrash metal death metal all the genres that you want to name it doesn't follow anybody else but everybody else seems to pull something from it so if you're a fan of heavy metal why aren't you listening to death (laughs) dan what about you well i mean i think you you guys have all said it you know but I mean, every heavy band that you listen to that, that's come out in the last 10, 15 years, they all listen to death. I mean, shit, man. At this point, I mean, death is so worn into the metal infrastructure that it's really hard to hear anybody do anything original that death hasn't done already. And like, it's not that there haven't been progressive bands that have gone above and beyond like the calculus nine you know that the was death uh towards the end there but like i mean i feel like death is one of those bands that if you are not aware of you need to be aware of them because they have and are still influencing every band that you like uh if you're into heavy music that's kind of all i have really have to say is that like death is absolutely that band that that gateway band that takes you from listening to kind of more normal metal music like a Megadeth or Metallica, uh, they step over the line a few times and they have to step over that line to introduce you to kind of more extreme music at large. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I think death is absolutely essential. So if you haven't been listening to death, turn this live stream off, turn this podcast off and go listen to some death because it's going to explain itself better than we have explained it tonight. What record? Let's. What record should everybody listen to first? Oh Which God! Would you recommend Dan. That's rough. Um, no, put me on the spot. Okay, I get it. Just say the sound um, of perseverance, because you know that's the answer. No, no, I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> I think I think collectively we could all say "Human" is probably sure. the first record that you would listen to by Death if you were trying to figure out what this whole big deal is. You know about this band? "Human" is the first record that really shows everything that the band is capable of even though it's not even the same band that's on the other records um this shows this shows kind of the pedigree uh that death is on it show it shows the influence that they have and it show it showcases everything they're going to do in the future and everything they've done in the past so i think it's a it's a really good place to start yeah i'd second that with you i don't even got anything else i would have to say it's the perfect record to kind of understand what the entire house looks like, not just what parts of the house look like, where they experimented a little bit more and went a little bit different ways uh, from album to album. Human is definitely just vast, you know, in its knowledge of music, I think. It's a great album, especially looking back. And if you're not into, um, you know, speed metal or thrash metal or things like that, it's, it's like probably the good album to be reintroduced to, to be introduced to i mean 
How could you not like an album that begins with the beat from Hot the Teacher? Bro? Yeah, I mean, honestly, what are you even doing here if you if you can't appreciate that? You know, that's hilarious. John John has absolutely blown my mind on that. He did not prep me for that, dude. Me me and John have been talking all week about about these records, and he'll say something like. Oh yeah, I like this record. I like this record, and then I'll be like, "Here's where you're wrong," because blah 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 blah. He saved that hot for teacher thing. Oh, Joe, and the Burberry ding. And I can't, and I can't, I can't, uh, I can't contradict it. <laughs> like, it absolutely is hot for teacher, and and for that, I, I salute the band. They're awesome. Like, imagine being the drummer. Imagine being the drummer, and you're like. You're like in the room with Chuck and he's like playing you the, the riff. And you're like, I really want to tell him that I think it should begin with the beat for Pop the Teacher, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to question yeah. Chuck? He's the George Lucas of death metal, right? Like, how are you going to do this? <laughs> how are you going to do this? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. That's awesome. Well, speaking of houses. We like to end these episodes with a album of the week from everyone, whatever you've been listening to this week. And I'm going to start with John. What is your album of the week? So I know I said it was going to be Stanko and You by Outkast, but I'm going to change it up. I actually have been listening to something more in line with this. I will say if you don't know Stanko and You, go please listen to it. Flawless record. Uh, but actually for a little bit of something more in this vein, because I always talk about hip hop and R&B, go listen to Counterparts. Mm-hmm. It is a fucking great record. That is going to be my album of the week. Damn, what about you? You serious? Counterparts? <laughs> I was expecting some sort of hip-hop. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Fine. Yeah, exactly. Counterparts. Fine. Uh, I've been listening to uh, Bloodlust by Body Count uh, because uh, John ordered this record. And for some reason... Fucking asshole. <laughs> and for, some reason, for some reason, they sent it to me instead of John. So I've spun it like four times. And uh, I love this record. And I think it's awesome. Let and me see how the record John. actually looks, by the way. Let me see how the record actually looks. Oh, come on now. John. You're going to put me it. on blast for fucking listening to my record. At least let me look at how it looks. Oh, fine. Because that was the whole reason I wanted it. It was like a nice blood. Sp- so I wanted to see how it actually looks. <laughs> You're not going to be disappointed, my friend. This is oh, this is blood yeah. splatter. Hell yeah. Like you've never you've never seen it. Cool. I've That's listened like to it a couple of times. coming on that shit. Well, dude, so here's the thing. It arrived yesterday um, on my birthday, uh, January 15th. So I was like, oh, that's really sweet. John sent me a body count record for my birthday. Like, that's so cool. I'm so stoked about that. Uh, And then I'm talking to John and he's like, wait a minute. They sent that to you? (laughs) I was like, yeah, dude, it's got my name on it. It's, It's to Daniel Terry from Revolver Magazine. Like, I mean, that's it's my record, right? And he's like, no. I ordered that. That's that's my record. And I don't know why it hasn't arrived yet. So now I got to go to the post office and I got to send it back to John because it's his record. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. So that's going to be my my album of the week is uh, is, is Body Count Bloodlust uh, because I've listened to it and I enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, what can can anybody really do not deny, you know, iced tea? Really? Christian, what about you? What's your album of the week? Uh, album of the week, man. It's tough. I listen to a lot of different music, so I have to pick two. I'm still stuck for heavy stuff. Uh, I'm still stuck on Only Self, the Jesus Peace album. Um, so good, man. Yeah, I, I, it is so good. I'm still stuck on it. You know, like I, I probably have like another two months of listening to it straight before I can go. Okay, I'll go on to something else. And then for uh, more experimental stuff i'm i'm stuck on the ghost main um ghost uh anti-con album very nice good yeah mental and just he's really taking hip-hop and what i think hip-hop and rock can do together to a new level does that one have jacoby on it i can't remember um i don't think the anti-con has jacoby on it unless it's on a part that i can't tell it's really him it could be but I didn't, I mean, I didn't look into the deed. I've just been listening to it since he dropped it. And it's just, it's phenomenal. I like music that experiments and that doesn't just sit still with where music is at, you know? Speaking of Jesus Peace, go listen to that uh, Nothing band. that has got Aaron Heard, the vocalist on bass. Oh, really? What is it called? Nothing. Nothing? Right on. I got to check it out. 
Well, what blows my mind is that, like, I remember back before COVID hit in 2019, this must have been like in, in March, uh, Code Orange was supposed to do a CD release show. Uh, and it was going to be Code Orange, Jesus Peace, and Zayo. And Zayo is like my favorite band of all time. And uh, they were all supposed to play that show. And I was so bummed out because the drummer from Zayo, like, he sends me a text message and he's like, nobody's told me that the show's off. He's like, so I'm going to go ahead and start driving from Pittsburgh. Or no, I was going to, I'm going to start driving from New York to, to Pittsburgh to go to that show. Uh, and I was like, dude, I feel like it's going to get canceled before you even get there. <laughs> and he, he sends me a message like, he sends me a message like four hours later and he's like, the show's canceled and I'm not there. Like, it, I didn't get there in time. Like it's, and then uh, Code Orange went on to to famously do their um, do their live stream. You know, one of the first bands to do a live stream. Uh, you know, instead of doing a, a full on concert. And um, yeah, like that's I was so stoked about that show. I wasn't I wasn't gonna be able to go because it was in Pittsburgh, but like I was super stoked about it. Like the band was stoked about it. It was gonna be like this huge breakthrough, and then. And then you know, 2020 happened, and and it just, they just it just didn't just didn't end up happening. But I feel like that would have been an amazing show with with Zayo, uh, uh, Jesus Peace, and then Code Orange. Like it would have been incredible, especially considering how good that record turned out to be uh, from Code Orange. Joe, what do you got? Genghis Tron board up the house. That's old school. I love it. It's amazing. Do you want some over the top extreme? dissonant shred whatever the hell metal is going on but with drum machines and keyboards it was very good this is the record for that yeah very nice well christian thank you so much man for 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 spending two hours almost three hours with us talking about death i mean that it's one of those things that it just kind of had to happen you know um we, we we did an interview a while back and we started talking about death metal bands and i felt like Man, like there's so much more that we could talk about, you know, and uh, we, you know, in the limited time that we did for that interview. So I was like, man, we gotta, we gotta figure out a way to, we gotta figure out a way to talk about a band and, and just dedicate the whole night to that band. So um, this was super, super, super cool, and I appreciate it. Um, appreciate you taking the time out and and then talking about this band with us, despite whatever John's opinions are. Incredibly grateful you guys had me on, man. Thank you for letting me you know blab about one of my favorite death metal my favorite death metal band that ever existed um you know obituary gives them a good run a good run but death is i don't know maybe i'm just um i have a soft spot for chuck who knows we all do r.i.p yeah i mean chuck is one of those one of those he, he he was a national treasure and to to lose him like the way that we lost him is ridiculous we talked about that a little bit on the last death episode about how like you know if you had a if you had a bit chuck chuck didn't get the treatment that he needed because he didn't have the insurance for it and that's just one of those things that i'm not trying to get political here but like if you name like a baseball player you know or a football player or a hockey player or 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 something something along that along those lines um you know i think that like we wouldn't have had the type of result that we had with Chuck. You know, I feel like he, he could have been, he could have been treated and uh, it's just disappointing that the, that the healthcare system in our country just didn't, wasn't able to facilitate for that. Even, even 20 years, 21 years ago, you know um, it's just, it's really disappointing and really frustrating. And uh, I wish it wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, we would have had, we would have had four more death albums. They would have been like calculus nine, you know, <laughs> like just, just, just completely blowing our mind uh, about music. And that's, that's just one of those things that just absolutely uh, puts me in a dark place whenever I think about it. Imagine if like, if he, if he never died and his vocals would have just kept getting higher pitch and higher pitch and higher pitch. Eventually he just wound up at Rob Halford. <laughs> Right, it's yeah, not a bad place gone, to land. He <laughs> He's like, I should have started at this, but uh, it took me thirty years to get here. It's fine. Well, we're gonna go ahead and end the stream here, guys. I want to thank everybody that has tuned in and watched the stream with us tonight. It's been a lot of fun getting your guys' comments and your your context uh, on this record or on these records and and all of that. So I appreciate every single one of you, and we will see you guys uh, next time. 
All right, y'all. Good night, yeah. fellas. Yeah, man. Was this was coming back. Yeah, was dude. Fun. This was so much fun. This was so much fun. I'm sorry we lost John, but there he um, is. you know, it is what it is. Oh, he's back. Okay. Sorry, John. I'm not gonna keep talking trash. But yeah, man, this was a ton of fun. I'm sorry it took three hours, but uh, you know, death is a band that that requires our full attention. So I've loved your names all night, John, by the way. I've been keeping an eye on the names, dude. It's amazing. Dan steals my records. Nice. MC MCP pants was really, really good, I have to say. I feel like there was a lot of wisdom coming from That was from my MCP favorite, actually. Tonight. Yeah, for sure. Uh, death, death it's all great. about candy. Yeah. Double gum and tap. That's actually I feel a like cool that's, great conversation. Like John, thing. let's yeah. just do a whole episode on MC Chris the next time Dana's sick. Yeah. I bet I can get MC Chris on a podcast. It probably wouldn't be that hard. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Christian, thank you so much, man. Uh, I'm going to go to bed, but uh, uh, awesome, I really bro. appreciate just it, man. Let me know. Just hit yeah. me up. Absolutely. This is so much fun. So much fun. Hey, man, you guys have a great night. Be safe out there. It was awesome hanging with you guys. Yeah, yep. you too, man. Talk Anytime. to you later. You're always welcome. Next time. Anytime. All right. Take us out, DFT. If you've ever been listening to this podcast and you've thought to yourself, man, I really wish you would talk about these bands that I've recommended. There's a lot of different ways you can reach out to us to recommend these bands. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can reach out to us on Twitter at Discuss Metal, on Instagram also at Discuss Metal. Uh, and you can uh, you can also represent discography discussion out on the street. If you go to our Teespring store, we have a whole bunch of shirts, socks, cell phone cases with our label all over them, our logo everywhere. And uh, you can check all of that stuff out at the link in the show notes. Also, there's a link in the show notes to our Discord server where you can chat with me and Joe and sometimes John uh, if he's on there. Uh, pretty much any time of the day as long as we're awake a lot of people hang out there you should hang out there too and uh, you know if you want to if you want to you know support discography discussion financially you can check us out at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal we have the sweetest perks available to man Uh, if you want to check out live streams you can go to our YouTube channel at discuss metal Dan Uh, I'm always doing YouTube content there and I'm also gaming on Twitch two nights a week on Mondays and on Thursday uh, at 10.30pm Central Time you can always check out my live streams at at twitch.tv slash discuss metal Dan I'll be playing some games and getting ready for my upcoming FPS podcast so definitely be sure to check all of that stuff out and with that I am out gentlemen I am out And on that note, this has been episode 207 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Hey, Joe, can I have some money? $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 